think uh, we should. Okay. Well, uh, good morning and uh, welcome to the uh, workshop um, um, section of the AI uh, symposium. So I think yesterday, I think we all saw how uh, AI and deep learning models are applied in, in different biological settings. But today, I think we're, we're really going to get into the details of, of the methodology and how it's developed and some background to, to these models themselves. And so, uh, so today we have uh, you know, two speakers who are really going to be providing some, some details on, on, on the methods and, and sort of giving you the, the background uh, knowledge that you need to really get started on, on some of these problems. So, uh, so our first speaker today is uh, uh, Dr. Sheng Li. Um, um, so Sheng and I uh, had the pleasure of sort of working together for almost four years, and uh, uh, he, he's just an amazing collaborator. Um, and Sheng um, uh, is currently an associate professor at the data science uh, um, at, at the University of uh, Virginia. Um, and he's uh, truly uh, an expert in, 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 in a multi, you know, multitude of areas, inclu including representation learning, graph neural networks, and visual intelligence and, and protein language models. And, and you've heard a talk from Zhang Liang, which essentially is a, is a result of our, our, our close collaboration for the past few years. And so uh, Sheng has won numerous awards for his uh, contributions, uh, including the Adobe Data Science Award, the Cisco Faculty Research Award, and, and, and uh, the Franklin uh, Early Career Scholar Award. So. He is the uh, editor of the IEEE Transaction Journal, and he's uh, uh, the invited chair of multiple computer science uh, conferences. So he's, he's truly an expert in this area. Uh, unfortunately, you know, he couldn't be here in person because of a family uh, issue, um, but, but I'm glad that he's able to join us through Zoom and uh, really walk us through some of the foundational models in, in protein language uh, modeling. So. Um, so uh, here's the format. So uh, because he's going to do this through Zoom, uh, the idea is he's going to give an hour uh, long lecture with about 15 minutes of questions at the end. That'll be the first uh, hour, and that'll be from 9 to 10.15. And then we go off on a 15 minute break, and then we come back and do the same thing for the next hour, an hour, uh, an hour of lecture and 15 minutes of questions. Is that, is that OK, Sheng, with you? Yeah, that sounds great to me. Okay, all right, fantastic. Thank you. So uh, without further ado, uh, let me kind of share your screen and uh, uh, get started. And, and one more thing. So uh, during the 15 minute questionnaire, uh, um, Zarif will not be walking around with the mics because you know, he, he needs to follow the lectures too. So if you could just come up to the, to the, spe to the, uh, you know, the microphone that's on, on both ends of the auditorium, that'll be great. So just walk up to the microphone and just speak up and Sheng should be able to uh, hear your questions. And I'll be happy to coordinate as well. Okay, Sheng? Yes. All right. Great. Okay, great. Well, yeah, take it away. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Cannon, for the introduction. And uh, hello, everyone. Good morning. I apologize for not being there in person due to COVID and other family issues but I still enjoy this opportunity to talk about uh, the foundations of deep learning and uh, protein language models, especially some current uh, progress and the future opportunities. And I hope we can have uh, intensive discussions on the topics. I will present the basic ideas and uh, some recent papers, but please feel free to ask any questions relevant to this topic. Let me share my screen. Okay, so as you can see from the title, the talk of today is uh, deep learning and uh, protein language models, foundations and challenges. And uh, as introduced by Dr. Cannon, we will organize the talk in the following two parts. At the beginning, I will give an overview for this talk and uh, we'll focus on the foundations of neural networks and deep learning. I Know that some of you may already have very good backgrounds on deep learning, but still, I think we can have this chance to review the fundamental knowledge and uh, some recent deep learning models together to see how these things evolve over the past uh, decades. So the first part will focus on the foundations, and uh, we will have a question-answering session from 10 a.m. to 10:15 a.m. 
feel free to ask any questions at them. And uh, from 10.15 to 10.30 will be a 15 minutes refreshment break. After that, we will come back and uh, focus more on the transformers language models, especially protein language models. And I will also briefly introduce several of our recent papers on the protein language models for different types of applications. And at the end, I will talk about the challenges and the future directions. So similar to before, we will also have 15 minutes for question and answering. Okay, then let's start from the fundamentals of deep learning. We will have three parts. The first part is foundations of neural networks. And second part is training and optimization. The third one is deep neural networks. This figure actually shows you a brief history of neural networks starting from 1940s until the beginning of deep learning year around 2010. Then you can see that the timeline of several important uh, models in neural networks, such as perception, multi-layer perception model, especially the back propagation algorithm, and uh, as well as the deep learning models proposed around the 2006. And the meanwhile, you can observe some up and downs of the AI field, mainly driven by the success and the failure cases of neural networks, such as in early 1980s, sorry, early 1970s, because of the limitation of perception model for dealing with the XOR problem, then AI faces the first uh, dark age, or we call AI winter. And uh, also in 1990s, because it is very hard to train multi-layer neural networks because of the limitation of hardware, because of the limitation of label data sets, then the statistical machine learning method, especially simple vector machine and uh, other relevant ones, they, give, they became much more popular than deep learning models, than neural networks. Then you can see that after 2006, when Hinton and the co-authors proposed the layer-wise pre-training, so people realized, okay, it is possible to train neural networks with multiple layers with some tricks. And then those models are at least comparable with the state-of-the-art statistical machine model at that time. Then after 2012, I will have a few more slides to show that, but you can imagine this is how the fields evolved in the past decades. And uh, when we talk about neural networks, we really think about uh, the similar things in our human brain. In human brain, we have about 100 billion neurons. They are connected in a very complex way. And uh, But if you look at the fundamental process of information processing, right? So we collect information. Each neuron collects information from neighbors after some aggregation and the processing. It produces the outcomes. And the outcome will also be served as input for other neurons. So this is a very simple mechanism. And uh, of course, we know that the human brain is much more complicated than we imagine. However, inspired by this kind of connectivity and information processing mechanism, we can design artificial neural network based on that. The very simple way, as you can see from this figure, is to have weighted summation of input values. And then the input value, the summation will be fit into the activation function, or we call it transfer function in the biology terminology. Then finally, we have the output. And in this figure, you can see that, assume we have n inputs from x1, x2, into xn. And for each input value, we also have the weight, such as w1, w2, into wn. And the weighted summation process can be shown in this equation, right? We have weighted summation, wij times xj. And the sigma here refers to the activation function, which is really a nonlinear function. Then eventually the output will be y. So this is how we represent the information processing mechanism from this figure. Or simply, if you want to write a more dense form, use the matrix, you can use uh, this equation, y equals to sigma of x times w. x is the uh, input values input matrix and W is a weight matrix. One important thing in that model is the activation function. And there are many different ways to design that. 
here I just want to give you two simple examples. The first one is the step function, which is defined from this equation and shown in this figure. The step function simply converts the value to one if the input value is positive. Otherwise, it will just use zero. It's a step function, just one, one step here. And there's one many major limitation on this one. This is uh, non-differentiable at points, some points. And the other one, which was also very popular in early ages of neural networks, it's sigmoid function. The sigmoid function is actually very uh, interesting, as you can see from this figure, right? Then if the value is too large, is, is very large, then the output will be very close to one. On the other side, the output will be very close to zero. So in the section of optim optimization, we will go over the major activation functions one by one and talk about the advantages and the disadvantages. For now, please just have a sense that, okay, there are many different options for the activation function. Okay, then, then it comes to the first of all the most sim the simplest model in neural networks, which is called per perception. Perception was proposed by Dr. Frank Rosenblatt in 1957. And uh, the idea is just like the figure we have just introduced, right? Given a number of input values, we have a number of associated weights, then weight is summation plus a bias term. Then in the original model, it used the step function. Eventually we have output. If we convert this figure into the equation format, this is the equation we have for the very simple perception model. And uh, in this model, we know that x is input and y is output. We already have them from our data set. And uh, the learning process refers to the procedure of learning the model weights, which are w's in this case. To update the weights, one can use the uh, grading update method. So we need to define loss function based on the model. And then we can derive the gradient with, uh, with respect to the model parameter, each one of them. We have multiple Ws. So here, we, for each of them, we can derive the gradient. In this example, let's say we are working on a regression problem. So it's easier to define the L2 loss function, the square the loss. Here, y of t, it's the ground truth value of y, and y hat t is a predicted value based on this model. Then we can define this loss function. Based on this loss function, we can derive the gradient with respect to the model parameter wg. And therefore, we can use this weight update scheme to gradually update the model parameter wt. And in this equation, uh, r here refers to learning rate. Okay, then the first model is actually, at that time, you, you, you know that we don't have very powerful computers. We don't have any GPU computation or advanced hardware to enable the computation. So it is very challenging to implement this algorithm using hardware. Then researchers developed the Mark 1 perception machine. So for this model, they developed a machine to implement and the application was for image recognition. So as for, as for input, they use a camera which captures 20 by 20 uh, photo cell array. So in general, you can imagine the input is a 20 by 20 matrix. In total, there are 400 pixels. They are the input X. Then what does the machine look like? Can you imagine what that look like? This is an image of the first machine to implement the perception model. Even for such a simple model, at that time, we had to use such a complex hardware a huge one to enable the connectivity of the network, right? You can see the numerous wires are here. They were used to connect uh, neurons one by one. Okay, then you can see the weights encoded in this machine. And also when you perform the weights updates, we already use the, so the, the researchers used the electric models to enable that. It was very complex, but at least uh, it's, uh, it, it demonstrated that the idea of perception can be implemented by machine. 
if we have a better machine, the model size, the processing time could be largely reduced. This is another figure to show similar configuration, right? For this very simple model, this is the input, right? Input a number of pixels, in number of values, x. Then you have some neurons, hidden units. This is output only one single layer, but the machine is like this one, very huge. Okay, then let's go back to think about the high level idea of perception. What does it do in the feature space? Right, we, we have data and we know that each data is a vector. Each vector can be viewed as a point in a high dimensional space. Let's say for classification, we have two classes, the green dots and the orange dots. Then if we use these samples as input of the perception model, then what will happen if we apply the if we apply the perception model. Essentially, it is a linear transformation of data in the data space. As you can see from this figure, this is our original distribution of two classes. And the perception, the original version, the linear model, actually performs a fine transform, such as rotate, scale, squeeze, or other linear transforms of the data space. Then you can, this is one possible solution, right? After applying this perception model, then it's likely that your data will distribute the will be distributed in, in this way. It's different than before, and sometimes it might be better for classification. For, for example, if some dots here they are very close and it's very easy to misclassify them. But if you can do a very good affine trans transformation, then they might be far away from each other. The two classes might be far away from each other. Then the final prediction accuracy, classification accuracy could be improved. This is how the transform works in the data space. And uh, if we make it more clear, let's say a very concrete classification problem. And uh, right now you can see that we have perception model can be viewed as a linear transform, right? We have the uh, weighted summation plus a bias term. And the weights can be viewed as slope of the classification boundary and intercept and the bias term can be viewed as the intercept of the, of the classification line. Then you can see that perception can be viewed as linear classifier for the binary classification task. Let's say we have two classes, two different animals, cat and dog, then this is a perception model. This is another one and uh, two more examples. Perception model seems very straightforward and uh, easy to implement, especially I when I see when, when I see implement, I mean mathematically, but for the physical implementation, it's still very hard at that time. And the people are very people are very excited about that because they think that they think if we expand the number of parameters, if, if we expand the number of input u, input units, they can use perception model to solve a lot of real world problems, right? This is amazing. You can imagine in 70 years ago, this kind of capability is indeed amazing. However, some other researchers, they identified a severe limitation of perception model, which is the XOR problem. XOR problem is defined in this table. If let's say we have two input values, X1 and X2, if they are the same, then the output Y will be zero. If they are not the same, output will be one. So that's why you can see if both X1 and X2, they are one, the output will be zero. If they are not, not the same, either 0, 1 or 1, 0, the output will be 1. So this looks like a very simple example, but can you implement X or gate, or can you, in other words, can you design a perception model to solve this problem? By solving this problem, I mean, given the input X and Y, this is your input feature. Can you predict the class label Y according to this table? Even it's simple, but the, 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 the Bad news is that we cannot do that. Why, why is that? If you, let's see, if you can draw these samples in the 2D, 2D space, you will find out the reason. So we can, if you view the Y as class labels, you can actually draw four data points. And for samples here, this is zero, 01, this is zero, 00, 10, zero, and 11. One, one. And there are two classes. As, you, as we mentioned earlier, the standard perception model is simply a linear classifier. Linear classifier means that we can only draw linear 
classification boundary in the data space. And if you have some samples that are distributed in this way in your data space, it is impossible to draw a linear line, a straight line to separate the green dots and red dots, no matter how you draw that. So this is the limitation of perception model. And uh, based on that, some researchers, especially Marvin Minsky, and his co-author wrote a book in 1969, they mentioned that there are some limitations of perception, so people cannot be very uh, optimistic about the perception model. And this is actually also, people view this one as the indicator of the first AI winter, the starting of the first AI winter. However, uh, later on, researchers found out that actually in the book written by Dr. Frank Rosenblatt, he already proposed the, the multi-layer multi multi -layer perception model, which can be used to address the XOR problem. However, at that time, it's not like today we can read papers on archive, we can see many online transactions and uh, proceedings. At that time, some it's it's possible that some research efforts were not discovered timely. And uh, one more bad news is that Dr. Frank Rosenblatt passed away at a very early age, I think it's, uh, um, at 43. So Therefore, for, for those reasons, people did not realize the potential of multi-layer perception model, and uh, they all become very, very sad about uh, the future of neural, neural, neural networks. That's why it's the first AI winter. So in the book, they mentioned that, okay, it's possible to have this multi-layer perception model, but people don't know how to train that until people rediscover the backpropagation algorithm in 19 in 1980s. Then in 1980s, uh, several researchers, including Ho including Hinton, they proposed the backpropagation algorithm. Although in earlier in earlier literature, there are some similar work on this on this topic. So, but they somehow reorganized the idea and uh, make it very clear and uh, demonstrate that this algorithm can be used to train multi-layer perception model. The paper was published on Nature in 1986, and it was actually a very popular method to train most of the, uh, even for now, for most of the neural networks models, we still use the backpropagation based method to, for model training. The main idea is to pass the gradient from the current error to update the model parameter. That's why it's called backpropagation, right? So if you think this is a forward, let's say this is a, forward direction. Forward direction means that we have input, we have first hidden layer and second hidden layer into output, this is forward direction. Then backpropagation means that uh, once we observe the error, we can backpropagate the gradient and the gradient can be used to update the model parameter at each layer. And here is one simple example of the backpropagation. Let's say we have a very simple computation graph. We have three input variables, x, y, z, and we have the operation as plus, then multiply. So this is the equation we have, x plus y times z. Then we can define the intermediate variable q, q is x plus y, and the final result f is a function, it's uh, q times z. Then our task is to derive the gradient uh, the partial derivative f to x, f to y, and f to z. And we can rely on those equations to derive that. Let's see. If we want to have f to f, this is one by definition of calculus. And if we want to have f to z, we can use f to f and then f to z. f to z will be three. Then, so given this, this input, input values minus two, five, and minus four for x, y, z, respectively. Then similarly, we can, if you look at the this case, the gradient of f to x, then we can decompose it using the chain rule, right? f to q and q to x. f to q is, the, the, the result will be z. z here is minus four, then q to x is one. So minus four times one will be minus four. 
So this simple example just shows that by using a chain rule, we can be able to calculate the gradient from the loss function to the parameter at the first layer. And this figure shows some definitions about the gradients. For example, this one we call it local gradient, and this one is upstream gradient. And then we actually apply the chain rule to calculate the gradients. Based on that idea, we can actually add up multiple layers and the back propagation can work with multiple layers as well. We can pass the gradient layer by layer and update the model parameter at the current layer and then the previous layer. Then based on that, we will have the multi-layer neural networks. So the simple model might be this one, the linear equation. Then if we have a single hidden layer, you can we can simply we can simply consider x as h and h it will be the one more layer, right? So this max here refers to the relu, relu function. Uh, don't worry, we will cover the activation function later, but this is the relu activation function. And this is the weighted summation for the first hidden layer. Then this will be the hidden values h, and this will be the second layer calculation. But this will be the second layer, the model with two hidden layers. Then if we stack multiple layers together, this is uh, deep neural networks with very dense connections. Okay, so if you want to play with a very simple and uh, illustrative examples of neural networks, I highly recommend you to play around uh, this playground.tensorflow.org. They offer this demo to help you understand the different uh, configurations of neural networks, simple ones. You can add neurons, remove neurons. You can try different input features. You can choose four different sample data sets and uh, setting the learning rate activation function or other things such as task, right? And then you can, you can see visually how the model converge after multiple iterations and how the model can help you learn classification, classification boundary to separate the two classes. So due to the limited time, I will skip the demo, but if you want to observe what does the model work inside the neurons, you can view this demo and then try different configurations. Okay, then I want to spend some time and uh, talk about uh, the neural networks for different uh, for different fields, especially for images and the language. The first part is for images. We we know that the standard perception model can only deal with linear inputs such as tabular data. But in reality, we also face many visual data, which are 2D signals. And uh, the fundamental work in this field is called convolutional neural network. This was first proposed uh, in early 1980s. And uh, in this paper, it also described the idea of using convolutional neural net networks for hand-written digits recognition. And this is another demo to showcase the idea of hand-written recognition. And this is the architecture of a, a standard convolutional neural, neural network. Let's say the input is an image and uh, we can apply convolution filters to process each patch of the input image. The result will be a feature map because you can apply multiple filters, multiple filters. Each filter is a matrix with some parameters. If you change the parameters, you have different filters, right? So if you have multiple filters, you can have multiple feature maps. Then once you have multiple feature maps and the feature map is also a high dimensional matrix, then the number of values will be largely increased. So one efficient way to deal with this issue is to perform subsampling or polling. So we can reduce the feature map size. And then again, we can apply the convolution filter again and get more feature maps. So on and so forth, after multiple layers, you can convert the feature map into one dimensional vector. And uh, finally, people use a few fully connected layers into the final prediction. Here, 
is the last layer as output. And again, this is another demo to showcase the values and the connections of the convolution network for hand recent digit recognition. I want to show you a few more examples to see how this works by applying convolution filters. Let's say this is our input image. We have an image with 28 by 28 by 3. So 28 by 28 is the size of the image, and 3 it refers to the channels. We, we, know that, we, we know that each color image has uh, three channels, red, blue, green, and uh, they can be viewed as three layers of the three layers of matrices. So the each image can be viewed as a tensor by the size 28 by 28 by, by 3. Assume that we use a kernel with size 5 by 5 by 3, and the kernel has some parameters we will need to learn. Then we apply this kernel filter on each possible location of the input image. Then the result will be a single value. So we apply this multiple times, one by one, then and putting together all the green dots together, it will be a feature map, will be the green feature map shown here. Then this is for the green filter. If we have a different filter, let's say a blue filter, an orange filter, then we can actually have different feature maps. We stack them together. This will be the feature map, seven of them. Then similarly, convolution networks is actually a sequence of convolution layers. We could apply multiple convolution filters and achieve this kind of feature maps. Then you may wonder what does that mean if we if we process an image, then what does the low level feature, high level feature, mid level feature refer to? I want to showcase this figure. It will give you a better idea about uh, interpreting the functionality of convolution layers at different stage. Let's see we have this input image. And as you know, the convolution filter actually processes each small patches of image. So the low-level features extracted by the model mainly indicate the low-level patterns of the input image, such as edges, corners. So they are very fundamental primitives of the image, very simple structures. Right? And for mid-level features, you can view them as, uh, as some sort of combinations of those low-level features. And they can be able to capture some interesting parts of the image, let's say, for face image, we know that we have uh, very, very standard facial components, eyes, nose, mouth, so on and so forth. Then interestingly, if you realize the mid-level features learned by the convolution neural network, you will be able to find some interesting patterns such as eyes, nose, mouth, right? Similarly, if you look at high-level features, which are again, the combinations of the mid-level features, then they will be able to compose some uh, facial structures from input data. So from this figure, you, you can see that the convolution networks with multiple layers are able to learn the concept of face from simple, from very simple and very small image patches at the beginning. So this is actually, actually called feature learning process. We don't have any handcraft feature extractor applied to the image, but the model Relying the model relies on the convolution filters, multiple ones, and uh, it will be able to capture these concepts from low level to mid level and to high level. Once you have the high level idea of the face image, you can apply the feature vector for the downstream applications such as classification. Okay, then if you look at the detail of the convolution operation, this figure shows the calculation of the convolution operation on 2D image. In a very simple case, it's a binary image, and we have this predefined filter. Then the convolution operation actually means the dot product of two small matrix, and then we have the summation of that. So this is our filter. This is the input image. We perform the dot product between this one and the top left corner of the input image. Then this is the calculation, right? So we, we do the multiplications and then the summation of the nine values, then the final result will be four. 
as I just mentioned, once you perform convolution operation, it's very likely you will have multiple high dimensional feature maps. Then it will be a large burden for calculation. So very simple and effective strategy to address the issue is to apply pooling. Pooling is a nonlinear downsampling method to reduce the size of feature map. The most popular way of pooling is called max pooling. Max pooling means that we simply keep the maximum value at each cell and simply discard all the other values. Let's say this is our example of the two-dimensional feature map, the input feature map with size four by four. If we apply max pooling, we can simply keep the largest values at each cell. In this case, the yellow part, the maximum one is six, the green part is eight, this one is three, and the other, last one is four. So we simply ignore all the other values and only keep four of them. So the feature map size will be reduced from four to four by four to two by two. Okay, putting all the ideas together, I want to show you a general structure of using convolution networks for classification. The, we usually view that as two parts. First part is feature learning. The second part is classification. For feature learning, given input image, we can apply multiple combinations of the convolution layer and pooling layer, right? That's why you can see the size of feature map can be gradually reduced layer by layer. Then we will also introduce nonlinearity through the activation function, such as the value function then reduce dimension by pooling operation. So eventually we can have a dense feature vector for the input image. Once we have this feature vector, we usually use a few fully connected layers at the end and uh, apply the softmax layer for final classification. Let's say the softmax layer for classification, we have a number of neurons, which, which is usually set as a number of categories. And uh, in this case, the category for this input image could be car. So you have a higher response for this neuron than other ones. Okay, then let's move to the second part, the training and the op optimization. For neural networks, especially for the network with multiple layers, it is really not non-trivial to train the models. And uh, it involves a lot of tricks and a lot of advanced uh, optimization algorithms. Here, I just want to give you a quick overview for the set for several most important design choices. The first major concept you may want to know is the selection of activation functions. We, brief, we briefly mentioned the sigmoid function and the step function at the very beginning, but here you can see there are actually many more choices. The sigmoid function will convert input into the range between zero to one, and the time function, which is very similar to sigmoid function in the shape, but the difference is that the range between the range of output for time function is between minus one to one. And then radio function, it's very simple and easy to implement. The function format is like this one. For larger, for positive values, it will simply keep the original value. And for negative input values, it will simply convert them to zero. So there's a limitation for radio because of treating all the negative values at zero and now centered as at zero point. So the leaky ReLU is an improved version of ReLU function. It will have this uh, very small, uh, sorry. It will have the, let's say, a constant value point, point 0.1 as a weight and the negative values will become much more smaller. Then there are also options such as max out and ELO function. I mainly want to talk about the issues with some traditional activation functions, such as sigma function. The sigma function, there are several limitations. The first one is that it will kill off gradients when saturated, which means when you have the you when your values are within this area from here to here, then you have valid gradients according to this to this shape, right? This is fun function. Maybe I can I can show a note here, right? So if your input value is within this region, then you can have valid gradient 
And this gradient can be used to help you train the model parameter, update the model parameter. However, if your input value is either larger than a certain value or smaller than this certain value, you can see this, the gradient for this area, for this region is almost zero. For this part, it's still almost zero. The issue is that when you apply the change rule, remember that for the change rule, we will have multiplications of multiple gradients. If any one of them is close to zero, then entire gradient becomes very close to zero. And then, which means the training is not effective. This gradient cannot contribute to the update of model parameter. That's why we have to use other activation functions to avoid this issue. That's the major problem of the sig model function. Then the other problem is that the outputs are always non-negative because the outputs of sig delta of x is always larger than zero. Then, then the gradients will, uh, will be positive. So the, sorry, the outputs will, will always be non-negative and therefore the updates will only happen in these directions. Then you may observe the zigzag path for model update. This is not effective. And meanwhile, this sigma function involves the exponential function E. This is very computationally expensive. A very sim sim similar version to sigmoid function is called the hyperbolic tangent function, or it's called, simply called tan function. This is actually a rescaled sigmoid function because it has similar shape. The only difference is that for tan function, the range becomes minus one to one. So this is zero center. We can resolve this, this issue, so the exact issue. But still, we have the other two issues, which means that the gradients will become zero in a large wide range of the input values. And also the calculation of exponential function is still expensive. Then radio function, it's, it's called, uh, it, it's, it's for the rectify the linear unit. The radio function is very simple and uh, easy to use. It's, it's still very popular nowadays. For this function, we don't have the saturation issue when x is positive and the computation is very, very efficient, right? You only need to compare your input value with zero. And uh, even people also view that uh, there are some more biologically plausible reasons for using this activation function. And it converts much, it converts much, much faster than the sigmoid function or time function. But still, the limitation is that this is not zero centered and uh, we have zero gradient for all the negative values. That's why there are some improved versions such as leaky ReLU. For leaky ReLU, we apply, we replace zero by this term alpha x. Alpha could be a constant value set by user or some researchers they design the more sophisticated ways to learn this parameter alpha, then the issues of saturation and the data value units can be resolved. The next one is max, max out neurons, which is actually a combination of the of two different ones, two sets of weights. So it's it, it can be viewed as a generalized version of ReLU and leaky ReLU if you set the parameter w and b to zero, then it becomes a radio function. But meanwhile, the downside of this method is that it will double the number of parameters because you have w1, w2, and b1, b2. That's for activation function. And uh, in practice, there are also several other important tricks we can use to improve the training of neural, net neural networks, such as batch norm. Batch norm is proposed to reduce the covariate shift problem in during training because we usually use the mini batch based training in the in the training process then it's possible that the distribution of batch will vary when we have multiple batches then the batch normalization actually performs much better than the standard training pipeline because it will reduce the covariate shift 
and then you can you can use a higher learning rate to improve the convergence rate. And the batch norm can be applied after every convolution layer, like this one. So when you have convolution layer, you can apply batch norm before the activation function. I also want to talk about the model generalization, especially the overfitting and underfitting issue, and how to address overfitting issue in deep learning training. I believe you are very familiar with this figure. It shows the overfitting and underfitting. Underfitting means that the model is not complex enough to obtain a very low training error, meaning that the model is not complex, is not good enough to capture the complex patterns in your data set. So on the other hand, overfitting means that the model is too complex. The model tries too hard to fit every single training sample. And consequently, the model cannot be well generalized to deal with other new samples, which means the generalization error will be very large. When we train neural networks, we have different ways to address the overfitting and underfitting issue. For overfitting issue, let's say if your model is trained to recognize cats, then you may have a lot of images like this one, the model will learn, okay, if an image, if a cat looks like this one, only if only if it looks like this one, I will classify it as cat. Otherwise, if it's too fluffy, if it's too fat, the model will not classify it as a, as a cat. That's the limitation. Then one idea to address the limitation is to apply dropout. It's still very simple, but very effective. The idea is to hide some information during training. Then the model will try to try to make correct predictions based on the data with missing information. In other sense, in other words, the models will be able to generalize better to uncertain scenarios. Let's say for human face recognition, based on the prior knowledge, we know that the human you already follow this uh, standard structure, right? We have two eyes, two eyeballs, one nose, and uh, two ears. This is very standard. Then if we cover part of the facial components, the model should still be able to recognize this is a face image. So similar to this idea, we can use dropout during training, which means we can randomly turn off some neurons in the sense that we can randomly cover some parts of the image and then ask the model to still predict the correct label for the input image. So this is the idea of applying dropout. We simply turn off some neurons during training and the dropout is only used during training. For test, once your model is fixed, you cannot, you cannot turn off some neurons because then the model will be changed. And for underfitting issue, a very, we know that the data complexity is not good enough to help you train a complex model. Then a very straightforward solution is to perform data augmentation, such as performing some kind of random rotation, scale, crop, or color change to introduce more diversity and more stochasticity for your data set. Then this kind of stochasticity will help you train a much better model. The next issue for training is about uh, regular, regularization. It means that uh, it's also a very important way to deal with overfitting issue. If we have two flexible weights, two flex models, the model will, will give you very low error for training data, but meanwhile, it cannot be used to pre pre predict uh, test samples very well. Then we know that a way to address the issue is to regularize the model weights. Let's say this is our loss function. And uh, we let's say this is a regression problem. This is our model f of x is our neural network model with parameters w and b. And this is the true label, the true response variable. This is a prediction. And we can actually add some regular, regularization term to penalize the model parameters w and b here. Again, there are different ways to do that. We can apply L2 loss, L1 loss, or other norms to regularize the terms. This figure shows that we can actually apply L2 norm to regularize the model weights. And uh, 
we can write it in this format lambda w hat lambda no sorry lambda w hat lab w in other words if you have a loss function then you can have two components of your loss function the first one is data loss it refers to the prediction error or fitting error of your of your term then the second one is the norm penalty. Here I want to show a few examples of the norm penalty. For let's say for read read regression for regression problem, if we choose Q to two, this is actually the read regression, and if you set Q to one, it's the last problem. We will encourage more sparse solutions in the weight vector W. And this figure explains why we will have sparse solutions for the L1 norm. I believe you are familiar with that. We'll skip it. Okay, then another part of the training is the loss function. You need to choose the proper loss function for different problems. For classification, we usually choose cross entropy loss. And uh, for regression, you can choose um, a squared loss or other ones. Okay, this is an example of the cross entropy loss. I think it's very standard, I will skip that. And hinge loss is also a very useful one for classification. It's, the idea is that we will also, so in, in the very standard cross entropy, la, cross entropy loss, we really only penalize the misclassified, misclassified samples. But for hinge loss, the idea is that we will penalize not only the incorrectly classified samples, but also the correct, correct ones if they have a small margin in the classification boundary. In other words, if you have low confidence for a correct, correct classification, you can still add a penalize and improve the confidence. This is the idea of hinge loss. And for op optimization, as we discussed earlier for the uh, gradients and the chain rule in backpropagation. The key is that once we have gradient, we can apply the gradient distance based update to improve, to gradually change the model parameter until you minimize your loss function value. The gradient distance algorithm is something like this. We have the loss values, and uh, this is how we choose the gradient the direction of gradient and update the model parameter step by step until we reach a minimum value. This is a standard gradient descent. And if you try the stochastic version, it's much faster, but meanwhile, it's not very stable because the estimation of gradient is only based on one sample, not a small batch, not a full sample set. This is the issue of the Stochastic gradient distance SGD, it has a long narrow valley, right? So if you if you start from here, then it is okay. But if your loss function has a counter map like this one, and you start from here, it becomes very hard for the model to jump out this region and reach the minimal value here. There are several improved versions for optimization, such as momentum. Momentum will build up a velocity for update. Let's see the, st the standard stochastic gradient distance update rule is like this one. We have the model parameter xt, and this is a linear rate alpha. This is a gradient. This is how we update the model parameter step by step. The momentum method will actually introduce one more component here. It will develop a velocity based on the previous gradient at a time t, then the direction will be more stable. You don't have to jump frequently here. Okay. And these two figures showcase the comparison between different uh, optimizers for training, a, for training a neural network. And you can see that some methods, they perform much better than others. I will skip the details. I want to highlight one figure here to help understand the connection between the connections among uh, multiple optimizers for neural, net neural networks. The most uh, 
basic one is a gradient distance one. We use all data to evaluate gradient and then make the optimal step to, for every iteration. This is how we, this is a very standard version. Then in order to improve the process, especially to speed up the calculation of gradient, the stochastic version will only use a small portion of data or even a sim single sample data, single data point to estimate the gradient. So it's much faster, but also not stable. Then after that, the momentum-based method or Nestor accelerated gradient method will build up, will rely on the previous information and uh, try to make the update more stable. And on the other hand, you can see the add grad, the RS, RMS prompt, they also have other design mechanisms to improve the update of gradients. And finally, I think the atom is still the very popular idea to, to choose as your optimizer. It's a combination of RMS prompt and the momentum. So it has advantages of both sides and uh, it's much more stable than the earlier versions of, of, of optimizer. Okay, then the next part, I will briefly talk about the deep neural networks. When people talk about deep neural networks, we usually want to refer to the very famous challenge of ImageNet. It was first proposed in CVPR 20, 2009, and uh, some researchers from Princeton, Phoebe Lee, Kai Lee, and their students, they collect a very large, large scale labeled data set, and they release the data set to public and ask researchers to submit, submit uh, solutions for image classification. It was quite a challenging task, right? Because it, because of the size is much larger than the traditional benchmarks and the categories is much more than before. When people try to do some human, human evaluation, the human performance is about 5%, the, which, uh, which is the error rate. And uh, in the ImageNet challenge, the two criteria for evaluation is top five accuracy and top one accuracy. I believe this is pretty straightforward, but now uh, you can look at this example to see what does that mean. For top one accuracy, if our top one prediction for this image is dog, then this will be a wrong classification. And if top two class classification if you look at top two classification error, and we know that our prediction is dog and alpaca, then we will consider it as correct because the correct label appears at the second position of the prediction. So this is the definition of top key accuracy. And this figure actually shows how deep learning models outperform previous shadow models in, in terms of the error rate, top five error rate over the years. The first two challenges starting from 2010 and 2011, people mainly use handcrafted features and the simple vector machine, different variants of simple vector machine for classification. And error rate is usually larger than 25%. And the big change, change point is here in 2012, when AlexNet was proposed, people can see that, okay, by using eight layers neural networks, the error rate can be largely improved from 25% to 16%. Then it gives confidence to researchers that the neural networks with multiple layers, if you train them properly, they will significantly outperform the traditional methods. Then the, the year after 2012, ZF network is an improved version of the AlexNet. They have sim very similar structure. That's why they, they also have the six, uh, sorry, they also have eight layers compared with AlexNet. And meanwhile, some researchers try to add more layers to the network and try to further reduce error rate. As you can see from the error bar here, error rate was reduced from 11% to 7% to 6 and to ResNet, which is even better than human performance with much more layers. Okay, I will only simply uh, very, very quickly go through the architectures of the networks to give you a sense how, how we can actually put together multiple layers to, to enable the such a 
remarkable performance on the challenging task of ImageNet. The first one is an improvement of the convolution network. It's, it's named AlexNet according to the author's name. Then it has about uh, 60 million parameters and uh, the batch size. You can see some details here. I will skip that. But the main idea is that the authors try to use two GPUs at that time to train the network. It's a seven layer convolution network. If you look at the structure, it's, it's very simple to, the, it's very similar to the traditional convolution net networks. The only difference is that they have um, more layers, uh, sorry, don't have, they have more layers, yes, and uh, they also use this kind of local response normalization to improve the activation calculation. Then at the same time, so there are some several points which differentiate this AlexNet from the previous convolution networks. They firstly use the ReLU function, which is better than the sigmoid or time function used in previous models, and it also converges faster. And uh, the authors use the dropout to deal with overfitting. It's also a very important problem because the dataset is large. If you don't deal with overfitting, the model will be easily overfitted in this dataset. And meanwhile, they do some augmentation and they have some uh, norm layers to improve the performance. After that, people know that it's it's a promising direction to add more layers to network. Then you can have even lower error rate. Then what if what if we add more layers, even more layers? If you add more layers, let's say the VGG network has sixteen or nineteen layers, and meanwhile to enable calculation, they have smaller filters. They change the number of filters to three by three. So here you can see the comparison between. The AlexNet and VGG16, VGG19. In VGG, in AlexNet, AlexNet, the filter size is 11 by 11, 5 by 5 at the beginning. But here, the filter size all changed to 3 by 3, 3 by 3. And later on, the next version is GoogleNet or Inception Network. It has a very interesting structure called networking network. So it's not a very a standard way to put together all layers together. But if you look at some uh, inner parts of the network, it has multiple paths. So if you view this one as a node, then this is a small network inside a big network. Because this network is too complex, it's not easy to train it by the end-to-end -end fashion. That's why you can see here the three ye yellow parts. So the, during training, they also, also add some intermediate loss functions to help the model convert faster. Okay, the next seminal work in this field is called ResNet. ResNet is motivated from the observation of overfitting or the de degradation of the accuracy with more layers. We know that by adding more layers, the performance could be improved, but is that always true? If we add more layers, if we always try to add more layers, if it's possible to train the model, then will the model always give me a better accuracy? The answer is no, right? If you simply add more layers, it, there's no, there seems no overfitting issue. But if you look at comparison between the 20 layer model and the 56 layer model, the 20 layer model performs much better than the 56 layer. This is error rate. Then this problems, this problem or this a uh, phenomenon motivated the researchers to think about what's the underlying issue with adding more layers. The major issue is that it's very hard to optimize deeper models. That's a major problem in this area. Then a plausible way to resolve the issue is to simplify the problem. Like we don't we don't want we don't have to deal with the original prediction problem. Instead Instead of predicting x, we try to predict the residue of the x. So this is motivation of the ResNet. In ResNet, by uh, if you look at the implementation, we can simply add uh, skip connections. So skip connection means that we will we will pass x 
as input of convolution layer or two convolution layers. The mean will x will be passed to this point, will be used as input for the next part as well. So by using the skip connection, you can have a more stable grading flow. Then it's possible to add more layers. In this case, it, you can have over 100 layers to train the model. Okay, now you can see the ResNet 34, ResNet 50, 101, even 152, they are all available and they, can, they, they became the backbone models for many image-based applications. Okay, the last page for this part is uh, model comparison. As you can see, this figure shows the comparison of top one accuracy for different models. For, for AdexNet, the top one accuracy is only about 50%, it's smaller, uh, slightly, slightly lower than 55%. But over the years, if you look at the latest models such as uh, ResNet 101 or InceptionNet V3, the top one accuracy is close to 80%. I believe the later models, uh, they achieve over 80% already. That's why uh, people cannot use ImageNet for evaluating those models anymore because when the model is too complex, it tends to overfit the data, even though data is large enough. Then this figure shows the trade-off of the model performance and the model size. Right? Sometimes the model perform, perform very well, Let's say the accuracy is very high, but meanwhile the model model size is still is also very large. And for some model, if you can improve the model design, let's say ResNet can achieve a good balance between model size and the, the top one accuracy. Okay, I think that's all for the first part. We discussed the, the fundamentals of neural networks starting from perception model. And then we also discussed the, the opt optimization and the training of neural networks. And finally, we went over several famous architectures of deep networks. Any questions? Any questions, please? Thanks, uh, Sheng. So if there are questions, please go up to the uh, microphone and ask your questions. One question, yeah. Can you hear the question? You want to speak up? Yeah. Yeah, Tom. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, how's it going? Um, for your perception slide at the very beginning, I was just wondering what the bias term was and how do you input a bias term and how to determine what bias is really? Oh, okay. That's a very good question. So for that part, I think the bias term is mainly used to stabilize the model prediction. It's it's actually you can you can view it as I think normally people view it as a let me try to draw something here. Uh, let's see. Okay. Let's say this is X and this is model parameter W, right? So bias term is actually another parameter to help you uh, reduce the difficulty of prediction. Because sometimes, like, let's say if, you're, if you have a lot of if you have a large value of x, sorry, this should be y. Sorry, I, I should use the other direction. Let me try to reach all the figures. So this is your prediction y. And this is x. This is w. So if you don't have bias term, then sometimes it becomes quite difficult to fit this value very well because the, because of the range of x, because uh, some uh, very, very skilled distribution of x, then it's very hard to directly fit this, this, this equation. Then by adding a bias term, it's easier for your model to fit the value, to re reduce the error 
this part is by height, right? The prediction. Sorry, let me try to. This is a prediction. Prediction is by height. And meanwhile, you have the true value y. And let's say your task is to minimize the difference between y and y hat. Okay. So if you the point is that if you don't use bias term, then it might be very hard to directly reduce the difference between the y and y hat. By using bias term, you add a constant, you add a, some um, intercept or offset to the prediction, it becomes easier. And in implementation, it's even simpler, right? You can actually add one constant at n of x, constant value one, and meanwhile, add one more thing here as b. So in this way, you still have a very, very compact form of the equation, but you already incorporated the bias term in your prediction. That's why in many, in many uh, implementations, people usually consider this as a pre-processing step, right? Given your data matrix X, you first add a, a column or a row of all ones for data set. And then you can view the last row or last element of your weight parameter as a bias term. That answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, sure. Any other questions? So, Sheng, while the students are thinking about uh, question I have, um, I, I just wanted uh, you to sort of clarify or maybe expand on the choice of activation functions. Uh, and you, you, you mentioned that it's sort of trial and error, but but is there is there a way to kind of you know let the data tell us what the most optimal activation function would be? Yes. Yes. Sure. So I uh, I think I think it first depends on the uh, some. So in, in practice, if you have a data set, it's better to first uh, perform some statistical analysis of a data set. I, I think this is very, very, very common. We all, we all do that all the time. And if you have some initial idea about, about your data, let's see, if your data is, is actually have very narrow range, then perhaps sigmoid is good enough to help you, right? Because for sigmoid, if you have a certain range, then you can still have valid gradients in most cases. But if your data is high dimensional and the range is large, then sigmoid will not be very effective. Then I believe RELU is still a very popular and effective way. It's simple, but it's effective in most cases. And you don't have some, if you don't have some, uh, let's say space or computation constraint, you want to try more complex versions of the activity function. You don't worry about the computation time then I think the max out or other advanced versions, they can give you maybe better performance for incorporating nonlinearity to your model at the cost of more computation time and the storage. So I, I, if I summarize what I just said, I think uh, if you don't have any idea, then try Redu first. It's, it's a safe choice in most cases. If you think your data is a good fit to the sigma function or other ones, you can try them first. And if you have more resources to try complex models than max out or other advanced versions can be a good choice. Thank you. Sure. Hi, Dr. Lee. Uh, akin to Dr. Cunnan's question, actually, I was gonna ask about uh, choosing a loss function, uh, okay. how, to, how to best appropriately choose a loss function. And there's so many cross entropy, hinge loss, vocal loss. How do we like, uh, is it is it task dependent, or um, are there particular loss functions that we could possibly you know start with uh, before exploring the sort of repertoire? Yes, it's a very good question. I I think uh, the cross entropy and uh, others they are they are they are outdated. They are very traditional, and uh, again it depends on your task, right? I, I think the latest ones such as focal loss and others they perform very well. And uh, in, in my understanding, a good way is to, to have several options and uh, try to compare them in your application, in your task, right? Because you, can, you cannot simply just uh, borrow the traditional, uh, uh, you, for example, if, if, you, if you read the paper, you saw that, okay, this loss function performed very well in the task, but it might, it might not be the case in your, in your problem. I would suggest that you have a few options Right, you you have the you always have the cross entropy or 
uh, or some other traditional ones at the baseline. And then you find a few more options from the latest papers as comparison. And then you try to rule out other factors. For example, you fix the, the other, uh, let, let's say you, you fix the model architecture, you fix other important uh, factors and only compare the difference caused by the loss function and the choose one, which is better for your case. But I, I don't think there's a unique answer to tell which loss function is always better than others, but it's usually, it's, it's usually case by case. But I think a good, good way is to design some rigorous evaluation for your problem and evaluate the multiple choices. Thank you so much. Sure. So, so what, one more question and then we'll take a break. Hey, Dr. Lee. Um, hey. You can hear me, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Cool, 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 cool. So I have a question about like uh, data augmentation and the mm -hmm. augmentation stuff of like uh, prep, uh, for like making your model run a little bit more, uh, at least a little better. Uh, so I was always I was told like, and I always have the thought of just like when you do uh, augmentation, it should make sense for the data and the task you're trying to predict on. Would it? Let's say you do an, a data augmentation that doesn't make any sense because like let's say I'm doing like sequence classification. Uh, and I'm just trying to uh, do like a binary classification. Um, and you end up doing like an augmentation that doesn't make sense biologically, but it still makes the, uh, the, the model run a little bit better. Would you say that's a good train of thought or a bad train of thought? Would that be like good or bad? Yeah, that's a very, very good point. Um, it's hard to tell, but I can see that. Um, hmm. Especially nowadays, people view data, uh, data augmentation as a very, very, how, how to say that? First, it's a very common approach. And second, the people really believe data augmentation will be helpful, but may not be helpful as you expect at the beginning, especially if you have a target task in mind. So in, in the scenario you just, you just described, I would think that augmentation is still a good, is still a, a, a good thing. For example, if you think about the, now these models, we already follow the pre-training and fine-training stage, right? And the, during pre-training, the augmentation, you may try many, many different ways to augment your data. And those augmentations may not be directly relevant to the downstream task you are working on. However, during training pre-training stage, this kind of augmentation may also bring some new insights to model training. We also bring some new knowledge that previous data cannot be simply provide. So in that sense, I, I imagine that the augmentation can always give you some additional information, but this kind of information is implicit. It's not directly linked to your final task. And uh, that's why I, I still think the augmentation is, is a good thing. But in your task, if you, if you have a very clear objective and you don't have the prediction state. You simply, let's say you, you just want to train a model for prediction and uh, you try to do augmentation. So in that case, I think you, you need to be more careful because uh, augmentation may, may, may lead to some uh, fitting issues of the model, right? If your augmentation can somehow enlarge the prediction of suspicious relation, correlations of data points. This augmentation, it seems improve the accuracy in certain tasks, but you also need to check if it still works well in other scenarios. In other words, you need to check if the model can be generalized to other cases. Yep. Yeah, I, I, I know it's not, it's not very, very good answer, but yep. to summarize my point is that in general, Augmentation is a good thing, especially for pre-training stage. And second, if you don't have pre-training, you only need to augment data and do prediction. You need to be very careful to inspect the correlation between augmentation and your final product, final prediction. Right. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Sure. So that's 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 a good uh, time to be taking a break. Uh, and so with data augmentation, I think domain knowledge is obviously important, and maybe we'll talk about that a little bit more in the in the next. Uh, uh, talk so so we're taking a 15 minute break and we'll reconvene at 10:30 okay 
Uh, Sheng, I uh, will see you in 15 minutes. Okay, thank you. See you later. Okay. No. We'll just manage. All right, uh, let's get settled. All right, Chang, I think uh, we're all back in here. So whenever you're ready, you can get started. In the second okay. part of, yeah. Sure, thank you. Hello, everyone again. Uh, now let's move to the next part, which is even more exciting from what I understand. So we'll talk about recurrent networks, transformers, and language models. And part four will be protein language models. All right, then I want to, I want to start from the basic ideas of modeling sequential data using neural networks. And then we will move to the idea of attentions, transformers, and also the latest develop, developments on language models, especially large language models. Okay, uh, let me see. So previously we talked about the networks such as perception, multi-layer perception, and uh, convolution networks. They all deal with static data, no matter type of the data, vectors, or images, they are static. But in practice, we also deal, we also need to deal with a lot of sequential data or time series data. It's a very effective way to deal with data by using networks. And uh, what will be the difference between those networks compared with the convolution networks we discussed earlier? As you can see in, in practice, such as language modeling, like this one, when you type words, the 
model should be able to suggest the words or next word on mobile apps. Or for stock price, we also have a huge demand of predicting the stock price for next day or next time frame. So a lot of these applications motivate us to explore this idea and uh, design new models to de deal with time uh, time sales data. Some earlier attempts, such as time daily neural net network, they try to consume time series data and uh, make prediction based on that. As you can see from this figure, we have a sequence of inputs. That's why you can see the timestamp xt here and t plus one, t plus two, t plus three. This simple model, the time daily network, they actually have a fixed number of neurons to capture a short sequence of input data. And after that, we have either one hidden layer or more hidden layers until we predict a out, out comparable Y. Then can you think about some limitations of this network design? Let's say uh, in, in practice, let's say if we use this network for modeling language, such as predicting the next character of a word, then the first four characters might be P, I, Z, Z, and then the model will be able to predict A. So we have word pizza. Then the major limitations are threefold. For example, first, this kind of time delay network, they only have fixed length input. For example, if you fix the input side as four, then this model after training can only deal with any sequential inputs with input size four. If you have longer words, if you have a sentence, then this model cannot work well, cannot be able to predict uh, the next word or next letter of your, of your input if the length is different. Also, it has a fixed length for output. In this example, it only predicts one character. But if you want to predict two of them, can you make the model work? Uh, clearly not, because, the, because of the limitation of the network design. And also, this network is very simple. If, if you use it, to, if you train it to predict next letter, then it's hard to reuse it for other purpose. It cannot be used to solve complex tasks. So this network is a simple extension of the multi-layer perception we have learned earlier, but clearly, as you can see, it's a not good option for dealing with time series data. Then we may have some ideas to address these issues. Let's see, can we learn the state transition of the, from the input we have? We try to learn the transition, let's say, from the first letter to second letter, from P to I, from I to Z, Z to Z. We only need to learn the same network multiple times after the parameters. And network is trained not to predict the last letter based on the first four input letters, but we try to predict the transition between every pair of letters. This idea seems more promising compared to the previous one. We can, it's more flexible. It can capture complex tasks it's more adaptive to the, to, to the new words, right? You don't have any requirements on the length of input or output. But still, it has a problem, right? You need to have independent trail each time. And also, you may, need to, you, you, you may face the many-to-one mapping or one-to-many mapping problem. What does that mean? We, need to learn, we, we want to learn the transition, right? We want to learn the transition from I to Z, from Z to Z, from Z to A. But here is the issue. If you have the same input, if the network is trained, and if you have the same input, then the network will give you the same output or very similar output if you have some randomness in the network. But here, what we actually want is to have different outputs. For the first Z, we want the model to predict Z. For the second Z, we want the model to predict A. Then if you simply use this state transition model, it doesn't work. This is a many to one mapping. And you also have one-to-many mapping, right? You have, oh, sorry, this is one-to-many mapping and you also have many-to-one mapping. I should be mapped to Z and Z should be mapped to Z in this case. So then the idea of recurrent network is that we want to keep the hidden state, but meanwhile, we want to use the hidden state as some sort of memory. So we still want to model the transition between the neighbor letters, 
But meanwhile, we want to incorporate the memory mechanism based on the hidden state from the previous time step. That's the general idea of recurrent networks. Then in this case, when we learn the state transition, we not only rely on the state transition prediction network, but also the hidden, hidden state from the previous time step. In this case, let's say if we want to use C and O to predict the next letter M, then the model will take input from the previous hidden state, which can be viewed as memory of C, then take the current input O, then based on both sides, the memory of C and the current input O, the model should be able to predict the next letter M. So on and so forth, this HT plus one should be viewed as some memory of all the previous letters, including both C and O. And for the last case, this memory HT plus four, because it has connections to all the previous hidden states, then you can imagine this HT plus four should be able to capture some sort of memory from all the previous letters from C, O, M, P, U. And then according to the new input T, the model should be able to predict the final letter of the word E. And uh, this is just general idea of using recurrent network structure for prediction, for predicting the next letter. And uh, you can actually modify this architecture for different applications. Here, at least uh, several of them. If you think about the one-to-many mapping, given one input, one hidden state, so, sorry, given one input, and uh, you can train the model using the recurrent structure for predicting multiple words, such as image caption. In the task of image caption, what we have as input is as an image, it's static. But for the image, we want to derive a number of words to describe the content of the image. So this is one-to-many mapping following this kind of structure. And for many-to-one mapping, is a different story. We have input as a review, a sentence, a paragraph con containing multiple words. But the final, final state, the final prediction is just a label, such as in the binary case, a positive or negative sentiment of the review. So this is a many-to-one mapping. And even many-to-many -many mapping, such as machine translation, we have input from one language and uh, we want to use the hidden states to model the memory, model the transition, then the model will be trained to convert or translate the input sentence from one language to a different one. And many to many mapping, such as video frame labeling, each for the input sequence, we have a number of sequential video frames. And for each video frame, we need to predict label. And meanwhile, so for the, for the prediction, we are not working on the image level prediction, right? So if you consider each frame as an image independently, you can still do prediction. But in this way, you discard the connection, the sequential cues from frame to, to frame. But in this recurrent structure, when we predict the first frame, we don't have any prior information. That's fine. We're just based on the current frame, the first frame to do prediction, predict the label for this frame. But when you are working on the second frame, frame number two, you can leverage the memory from the first frame. And based on the current frame, you can make a better prediction for the label of frame number two, so on and so forth, until the last one, you can make a prediction for the entire video. And that, that is the idea of the recurrent kind of structure. And uh, we don't have to draw this kind of figure, such as so many hidden states, if you have a long input sequence, it's, it doesn't make sense to draw this figure all the time. So a better illustration is to use this connection to show, okay, this is a recurrent structure, meaning that we have a variable t here and uh, the model xt as our current input. And uh, when we do prediction based on hidden state, it should rely on the previous hidden states, ht minus one. Mathematically, we can write down the prediction of recurrent networks in this way. HT is our hidden state at timestamp T. And uh, 
ht is a function of current xt and the previous ht minus one. And when we do prediction for yt, yt is based on the current hidden state ht and the input xt. So we have two sets of model parameters. wh is used to model the transition from input to the hidden state. This is how we, this is hidden state h, right? So this is how we use model parameter wh to map xt to h. Then we use another set of model parameter wy to help us model transition from the hidden state and the xt to the final output yt. Okay, then here we have the terminology for different uh, terms of the equation. This is called updated state. This ht minus one is a previous state. xt is current input. So every time when you see the t, it means current, and t minus one, the previous one. And yt is the final prediction. And here, uh, w, y, w, h, they are model parameters. And now we know that w are time independent. This is very important. So from the equation, you know that h hidden state is time dependent. For every time stamp, we should have a different hidden state, different hidden vector. And xt is time dependent because at different time steps, we have a different input. yt is also time dependent. The output will be changed. But for wh, wy, we don't have any subscript t here, which means they are time independent. What does that mean? If you look at the previous figure, it means that we, let's see the very simple case here. They have the same color, the same block, meaning that we, this is the same network. They share the model parameters, all the model parameters. They share the same set of model parameters. Okay, this is a very unique feature for recurrent networks. Okay, and uh, we can also introduce nonlinearity to the recurrent networks by using activation function. In this case, uh, in recurrent networks, we usually use time function to produce, to, to pr process the input value after weighted summation. Okay, then now let's take a look at how to unroll the computational graph for calculation, especially for calculating the gradients in order to optimize model parameters. Here we can see, let's say, starting from the timestamp zero, we have input x1, x2, x3. For each of them, we first use the weighted summation, wh times, uh, wh times x1, plus h0. And then the re result will be fit into the time activation function becomes h, h of one, so on and so forth until we have h t. And then meanwhile, we have another set of parameters w, y. w, y is the same across all the time steps. And we can predict y1, y2, y3. Then it's possible to define the loss or calculate the loss at every time step. And finally, you have overall loss function, which is aggregation of all the loss terms for every time step. So this is just one example. Sometimes we don't have to calculate the loss for all the previous time steps. And then we simply, so sometimes we don't have them. We only calculate the loss at the last one. So it's case by case. Okay, then for one one to many mapping, meaning that we only have one input such as an image. We only have one single input unit, such an image caption task have image as input, and the output will be a number of words. Many to one mapping, such as a sentiment classification, we only have one output, y, y of t, but we have a number of inputs such as a number of words in your review. And many to many mapping, such as translation problem or sequence to sequence model, which is also a very 
an important technical for machine translation. For the op optimization of recurrent networks, we actually follow a very similar idea as before for the backpropagation. And here I can show you the process of backpropagation. We start from the end value, the loss function value, and then we backpropagate the gradient to previous layers. Let's see if we can get the gradient to wy and uh, w to wh. Then we can use the value of the level five to get the gradient for this layer and until the first layer. Although the model seems very simple, but it can produce very interesting results. Here, I can show you one example. It's a character level language model. It's a very early version of language model. Here, we don't have any attention mechanism. We don't have any GPT-based models, but, but only use the vanilla LSTM or RN model to and, and try to try to model the language tra transition in English. So compared with the, uh, here we may use the one hard encoding to encode the input language. Let's say we have text file and we know the vocabulary such as the unique correct, unique characters at the back of features. Then we can have one hard encoding to produce every single character such as A can be produced, can be processed as this one hard encoding with one at the first position and zero at all the other positions. And similarly, for letter B, only the second position is one, all the others are zeros. Until we have Z, the last element is one. This is one hard encoding for the letters. Then we can develop such a recurrent network to perform language modeling. Let's say we have a number of words we can use this model to predict the next uh, character of the word, such as H to predict E, E to predict I, or sort of L, L to predict L, and L to predict L. In this way, we can train the model and update the model parameter. Once you have this model, here is something you can achieve. If, for example, if you use all the existing work by Shakespeare to train the model. And then you ask a model to produce some new poems or new paragraphs. This is the result from the model, right? It looks actually, it looks very impressive because the model trained on the character level can already produce something looks realistic and meaningful. And if you look at the detailed outputs during training, you can also see that how the model evolved over time, over multiple iterations. At the one, first 100 iterations, the model has not been well trained. That's why it simply produced some random jumbles like this one, that it doesn't mean anything, only some simple combination of words, even there's no correct uh, structure, right? You have comma here, this is not a real word. The, that's the, at the beginning, the model has not been well trained. It can only produce this kind of output. But after, 300 iterations, it's interesting that the model can be, has been learned to generate some quotes or periods. So you have some, uh, something more like a sentence or paragraph structure. And with more iterations, such as iteration 500, the model starts pr pr producing some simple words. And for 700 iterations, the model tries to produce something look like English. And with 2,000 iterations, you can see some words, some uh, valid sentence produced by the model. Here you can see the potential power of the recurrent networks for modern language. Right? For language, we already have this kind of very natural sequential structure, and we have strong dependency between the characters in the words. Then if you have sufficient data for train the model, the model size is good enough, then the model is itself is able to produce or generate a language like this one. And the authors also did some interesting explorations by using Wikipedia as input data. 
In other words, you train recurrent network using Wikipedia and then ask the model to generate some, some Wikipedia, something like a Wikipedia page. This is a fake page produced by the model. Even the URL is fake. It looks like real, it looks like a real one, but it's a fake one produced by the model. And uh, if you have some, let's say if you have a very specific structure of the data, the model can also learn to generate the structure, not only for language, but also the structure. Okay, that's the general idea of recurrent network and also some potential powerful applications of the recurrent network. But for the vanilla model, there are very important drawbacks of that, especially the problem of long-term dependencies. The thing is, if you use vanilla recurrent networks, uh, it is able to predict the next word in a short time frame. If you have a long sentence, if you have long paragraph, the model is not able to do that. For example, if you only have a short one, let's see, you have the sentence like this one, the clouds are in the, and you want to predict the next word. So this context is good enough to help you predict the next word should be sky. So a short sentence, the context is sufficient. The model is good enough to capture that. But if you have a long sentence with more context, then the model is difficult to predict the correct word. For example, in this example, we have a paragraph first sentence mean that I grew up in South Korea and uh, the last prediction is, okay, I speak fluent English and uh, something. So if from, from human being, we know that, okay, the first sentence mentioned South Korea, so this should be Korean, but for model, especially for recurrent network, it can only capture a small window, a small context. Then it's very hard for the model to make good prediction, right? So that's the, long-term dependency issue. The reason is that uh, the gradient can be multiplied a lot more times according to the change. And if, if you have a long context, then it's likely some of the terms might be smaller. And if you, have mod if you multiply several smaller times, several smaller terms, the final gradient value will be very small. Then you won't be able to have a gradient, have an effective feedback to help you perform backpropagation. That's why the vanilla RN is not used effective for long-term, for long sequence inputs. If the gradients are large, we can easily do the clip idea to, to, to make them in a certain range. But if the gradients are very small, then the training becomes a very very tricky issue. One solution is to introduce forgetting mechanism and develop the long short-term memory net network, LSTM. This is the general uh, structure of the LSTM with forgetting mechanism. And uh, still we can follow the repeating modules of neural network. We have multiple repeating cells. But the major difference between this LSTM and the vanilla RN is the introduction of cell state and uh, forget state. For cell state, it's the it's only for internal use and it uh, can be viewed as a highway of gradient with any interactions. Let's see, this is the gradient from the, sorry, it's a hidden state from time t, t minus one. And this is a CT, you can see we only have multiplication and addition operations on it. it it's, we don't have any, any other major operations on it to affect the value of this state. Then we have the forget state or forget gate in LSTM. The idea is to train the model and ask the model to decide whether to erase the cell state or not. If you, if you want to erase the information in cell state, then this value can be trained as very small. And you can imagine a small value times cell state will erase the information from the cell state. Then this part is input gate and uh, tan gate. It's mainly used to write more information, write new information to the hidden state. I will skip it. And next one is output gate. 
it will decide what information will be used as output. It can be viewed as a filtered version of the cell state. So cell state comes here and it will uh, go through the time function with the uh, multiplication with this output value. Then the final result will be the new hidden state HT. So this structure seems more complex, com more complicated than the vanilla RNN, but it produces a very effective way to decide how to erase information and how to write new information to the hidden state. And it can, can be used to model long sequence inputs. In addition to the standard LSTM, there are also some other improved versions, such as uh, this one. You have gate layers look like cell state, and uh, also the GRU, the gated recurrent unit, is a simpler, simpler, simplified version because it merges the cell state with hidden state. OK, some general guidelines for using vanilla RNs or LSTM. In general, we know that if you have some long sequences in your data set, the vanilla ions cannot work very well because of the gradient explosion or gradient vanishing problem. And the usually LSTM or GRU, they are more favorable than the standard RNN. Okay, then now you have some ideas about uh, using RNN-based networks, meta LSTM or GRU, to model the sequential data. And then we want to talk about attention networks. It's a different idea based on those recurrent rec patterns. And uh, it's also the foundation of language modeling, large language modeling. The RN we have seen so far follows this structure, such as sequence to sequence model or many to many mapping. We have input from one language. We, we have the hidden state, hidden state one, hidden state two, hidden state three, and they are all used to. Uh, as input as for the decoder. And uh, with more hidden states, the decoder is able to translate the input sentence to English. Then a seminal work in this field is published, uh, was published in 2015. It's called Neural Machine Translation by Joint Learning to Align and Translate. In this paper, they also proposed the sequence to sequence mapping with attention. Now I want to show you how that attention works in this paper. Let's say this is our, uh, this is actually a very small modification of the RN network. In RN network, we don't have the concatenation or combination of all the three hidden states. This is RN. In RN, we only have hidden state one, hidden state two, hidden state three. Then hidden state three, the blue one, is linked to, is used as input of the decoder. And then, we use it to, uh, I said we use it to translate the language to a different one, right? In other words, in RNN, we simply assume the blue hidden state already captures all the information from timestamp one to three. It already captures information from the red one, the green one. That's why we don't need to use use them again in this place. But here, for attention based mechanism the setting is slightly different. We need to move them here. In other words, at this time point, we believe all the hidden states are useful and we only need to assign them different weights. That's the place, that's the place we can apply attention. Okay, please remember this is the key difference comparing with the recurrent network structure. Okay, then based on these hidden states, we use them all and they are all contributing to the decoding part, which are translating the input sentence to a different language. Now the issue is, how could we get the attention scores for three different hidden states? Okay, so the hidden states, the attention scores are computed on the decoder side. Here is a toy example. We can have original score such as nine, six, and eight. And we will do a softmax to have them to have the probabilistic values. So the summation of the values will be one. So now you can see the relative weight of each hidden state. And then you can see the 
darkness of the color, right? The darker the color, the higher importance, the higher the weight. In this case, the right hidden state has more weight than others. This makes sense, right? Because when we predict the first letter, the, sorry, the first word, when we translate this language, the first word, the first word should be more relevant to the first word in your input sentence. That's why the right hidden state should contribute more to the translation of the first word. It has larger weights than others. Then based on the weighted summation of the three hidden states, we can use it to decode the first word or translate first word from H to I. Then for the second one, we apply similar idea, right? We calculate the weight again. In this case, the translation of second word should be more relevant to the second word in your input sentence, which is corresponding to the green, green hidden state. That's why the weight original attendance score 11 is much larger than four and five for the first word and third word. Again, we apply the softmax to get the weight, actual weight for the value. And eventually we have the weighted summation again, and then we can produce second word love. Okay. Then for the third one, the idea is pretty the same. We can get attention score, get the weight and the weighted summation and combine with a new hidden state for the prediction. I love cats. The third one will be cats. Okay, that's one illustration of the attention mechanism. This figure shows another example of the attention mechanism. We start from input sentence. It's still the translation problem. We start from input sentence. This is a source sentence. And we have some initial input word embeddings because for the words, we cannot directly process them. We have to get some word embedding first. Each word is processed as a dense feature vector. Then we have the initial RN state to get the hidden state first. Then we have the, let's say, output embedding. Can, can, based on the hidden state and output embedding, we, the initial output embedding, we can have the attention score. And for the attention score, we apply the softmax to get the probabilistic value. Then we have the weighted summation. The weighted summation will be will be uh, com combined with the initial output embedding together to produce the new hidden state, to produce the new prediction. So, so, so the process is similar than the previous example, but the, here you can see a different uh, illustration of the example. So on so forth, we can do prediction for the second word, third word, until the last one. So I want to mention the key idea here is that the calculation, um, sorry, I want to mention two points. First, you need to have some initial word embeddings and initial RN hidden states, even zero, even zero vectors. But it should be, you should be, you should have some initial hidden states. Then based on that, you can calculate the attention score. And once you have attention score, you get the weighted summation, weighted vector. Here, this is used to predict the new output from the from the, the decoder side. Okay. Okay, then a major question in previous example is how to calculate the attention scores. Here you can see several different ways to do that. The most straightforward way is to simply use the dot product. We have hidden state HT. We have the, so the from the source side, we have the hidden state S key. Then you can simply use the dot product to get the inner product of the two vectors. So this is original score, attention score. You can also try some other 
advanced ways such as bilinear product. Bilinear product means that we have HT at one side, SK at the other side. In the middle, we have a learnable parameter matrix, W. And size of W should be controlled according to the size of the latent vector. For example, if the latent vector is one by four, this one is four by one, then the size of this matrix should be four by four. And this matrix is really trainable. It's also a trainable matrix in your model. Even further, you can try to apply multi-layer perception as a model to help you predict the attention score by using HT and SK as input, and you train the model parameter W2, W1 to give you the attention score. There are different ways to achieve that, but the main idea is to estimate the correlation of similarity between SK and HT, the two input vectors. In the example of model translation, uh, uh, sorry, uh, in the example of machine translation, we know that there are strong correlation for corresponding words. That's why you can see the high weights, the higher weight for the first word when we predict the first word, higher weight for the second word when we predict the second one. So normally, the attention scores should follow such a pattern. And this Illustration, the heat map also shows this example. If you translate this sentence, this is a sentence in English. This is a sentence in another language. And uh, you can see in most cases, they have the one-to-one -one correspondence. The diagonal part is highlighted. The first word contributes more to the prediction of this first word. And here, the second word and the some words here, they contribute more than others in terms of predicting the corresponding word. But meanwhile, considering the different uh, grammar or structures of different uh, styles of different language, we also know there should be some shift at some position of the words uh, of the sentence. That's why you can see some parts are also highlighted here because of the shift across languages. And this one also shows the attention score and how it contributes to the prediction of words. Based on the idea of attention score, as you remember, the previous paper was published in 2015. Two years later, we know that this is a very famous paper called Attention is All You Need, which is a foundation of transformer, transformer models. And the, the very interesting part of this paper is that it is solely based on attention mechanisms. We don't have any recurrence or convolution designs in network. This is very interesting because we don't need the recurrent structure anymore. And this is actually the key idea behind the large language models. For example, starting from Elmo and BERT and uh, some variants of BERT until GBT or LAMA, we, they all based on the idea of self-attention from this paper. And this, this table helps you compare the different uh, mechanic, different architectures in terms of the processing with encoder, processing within decoder, and decoder-encoder interaction. As we know, in the previous example we discussed, uh, such as the uh, sequence-to-sequence embedding with attention, we know the encoder part and the decoder part, they all rely on either RNN or CNN structure. And, uh, as for the interaction, we use the attention mechanism. So this part corresponding to the example I introduced here, this one, right? Maybe I can show a different figure, this one. So for encoder part, we have the recurrent structure. This is a recurrent structure. We have multiple hidden states. And again, for decoder part, we also have the recurrent structure. And in terms of the interaction between encoder and decoder, we have the attention mechanism. This is a sequence to sequence architecture. Okay. Then after that, for the attention is all you need for the self-attention mechanism. We don't have any of those kind of recurrency structures anymore. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Let's go to the next page. So here you can see for transformer-based architectures, for all the encoder, decoder, and the encoder, decoder interaction, we only use attention mechanisms. And this is how it works. I can play this short demo very quickly. As you can see, this is how the self-attention works. Given this input sentence, output sentence, we calculate the attention score based on some key values and then normalize the score and the score will be used. The, the weighted summation will be used to prediction, to the prediction task. Okay, then here you can see a more detailed introduction of the self-attention mechanism. In this case, we don't have the recurrent, recurrent structure, then it becomes very tricky if we want to calculate the attention score just based on the input sentence and the hidden states. That's why here, let's say this is our input sentence. We have some initial embedding. The, sorry, this is the word embedding first. Then we have two copies of the hidden states, the green one, oh, sorry, the yellow one and the red one and we call them key and value. So the key will be used to calculate the attention score according to one particular query. In this case, blue one is a query. Query means that now I want to predict the word, the third word cat, and uh, I have some initial embedding for cat. And now I want to know what's the correlation or what's the similarity between my current embedding, initial emb embedding, and the embeddings of all other words in this context or in this sentence. I want to evaluate what's the similarity between the blue embedding and all and embeddings of other words. And for embedding of our words, we should, we should maintain two copies. One copy is the yellow one, which is only used to calculate the similarity score. And meanwhile, because we need to update the embedding, so we have a different version, we call the value. So the red one will be updated according to the new score. So it, it, is, it is a bit tricky because we have different versions of embedding, although they all refer to the same word. And uh, we do have a strong need to do that to make sure everything is not confused. So to make it simpler, given this query, the blue one, we calculate the attention score by calculating the let's say the inner product between the blue one and all the yellow ones. Based on the query and key, we have attention score, this one. And attention score, we can use them to uh, multiply the red one, the value, which, which is uh, another copy of the embedding. And eventually we have the weighted embedding for, the, for, for this word. Okay. So this is how we use the self-attention mechanism to update the embedding using attention scores. And this is the corresponding equation. We have Q, K, and V. Q is a query, K is a key for each vector, and V is a value. And we first calculate Q times K, and this part gives you attention weights. And based on attention weights, you can update the embedding. And this is just the one way to, this is just the one implementation of self-attention. And you can imagine we could have multiple different versions, right? For example, if you can, you can have different initial embeddings, you can have different uh, uh, ways to calculate the attention scores. So we call it the one head in the multi-head attention mechanism, uh, sorry, the multi-head attention block. This is one head means one implementation of the self-attention idea. You could have multiple ones based on the different implement implementations. So head one, and we could have head two, head three, using different colors. And uh, overall, we call it multi-head attention. So different head is just a different uh, implementation of the self-attention mechanism. And the good thing is that 
based on the multi-header tension, we could have this kind of ensembled, ensembled embedding for from different input channels. Okay, overall, this is a model architecture for transformer. If you look at inside the architecture, you can find out given the inputs, we have input embedding and positional embedding, positional encoding. And uh, for the encoder part, this is encoder. For encoder, we will have the multi head attention. And uh, we have some add and normalization operations. After that, we have the feed forward network, then again, add and norm. This is an encoder network. The major components are multi header attention and the feed forward network. Then for the decoder side, it's very similar. We will have the mask, the multi header attention module, another multi header attention module, a feed, feed forward network, and eventually the linear layer and for soft max layer for prediction. Okay, this is a general structure for transformer. And the reason of adding this feed forward network is to ask the model to process information a little bit before feeding the information to the decoder network. There are several important designs in this network transformer. We have layer normalization. This is a very useful way to help you improve the stability of model training. In this way, we can normalize the weights layer by layer. Another one is positional encoding. The motivation of using positional encoding is to tell the model to remember the location, the position of the word in the in the input sentence, because we, we will need to fuse the embeddings together. Then the model may forget the position of the different words. And here by, by telling the model the location of each word, such as using zero, one, two, three as a positional encoding, we can somehow incorporate such knowledge to the embedding process. Based on the idea of transformer, there are several variants for language modeling. Five, I think five or six years, six, five or six years ago, the BERT model was very popular. And it's actually the bi-directional encoder representations from transformers. In other words, it, it only adopts the encoder part of the transformer network. For model training, it used the uh, mask the language modeling and the next sentence prediction. Given the given the text corpus for as training data, we can have these two objectives to train the model. What does that mean? So the next sentence prediction means that given a sentence, let's say this is our sentence. We this is a, a special token to indicate the start of sentence. This is a mask. And uh, this is a separation between two sentences. So we have two sentences. And uh, if these two sentences are next to each other in your training data, we have a true label. The label is positive. This is A is next. Otherwise, if you randomly compare the two sentences together, let's say this sentence and this sentence that from two different paragraphs, then the label should be negative. They are not next. Then you can use this merge the sentence as input of your model and ask the model to predict whether they are next to each other or not. This is the next sentence predict prediction task. So in this way, you will have a lot of label data because this label is very easy to achieve. Then you can easily get a large amount of label data for model training without annotation. Another way to train the model is to use the masked language modeling. This is also very useful and popular. The task is defined in this way. If we have input sentence, we can randomly mask out a number of a number of words from the sentence. In this example, we can randomly pick 15% of tokens. So token means a word in this example. And then we re replace 
each of the chosen token with a special token, such as mask. And then we ask the model to predict what's the word at this position. So in this way, we give some incomplete sentence as input of the model and ask the model to predict the correct word. For language modeling, we usually have several different training pipelines. Here, this figure shows the uh, three training paradigms. The first one is autoregressive language model. And this is one direction, meaning that given a sentence, we can use it to predict next word based on the sentence, only one direction. And the, for BERT-based models, we usually use a bidirectional language model. It means that given a sentence, we can predict from left to right and right to left. And for mask language model, means that we can mask out some of the words and ask the model to predict the missing words. So BERT is only using the encoder part of the transformer. On the other hand, the GPT-based models, they only use the decoder part of the transformer. So GPT is short for generative pre-training for language understanding. And you can see that uh, the traditional, the standard version, the earlier version of GPT adopts a 12 layer transformer decoder without any decoder encoded attention mechanism. There are multi multiple versions of GPT starting from the first one. The GPT-1 is improving the language understanding by generative pre-training. So it's the it's the first paper to introduce this idea of GPT. Then after that, the authors try to uh, demonstrate that the language models are unsupervised mask the learners. And for the GPT-3, they even they, they, they further improve the model size and also showcase that the larger GPT models could be future learners. And uh, after that, they have GPT 3.5 with a reinforced learning from human feedback, which is also the backbone of the early version of chat GPT. And recently, they also have GPT 4, which can take inputs from multiple, multiple modalities, such as text and images. And they can do the more advanced uh, image understanding task. Okay, so here I want to use a few slides to briefly talk about the idea of reinforcement learning from human feedback, which is a key idea behind ChatGPT. So general idea is that if we have some text data sets or prompt, we can use human feedback to improve the text and use this text to further improve the pre-trained language model. Let's say we have the initial language model here and given the prompts and text, given some human feedback and guidance, we can use them to further improve the language model. This is a high level idea behind the reinforcement learning from human feedback. Then in detail, what they do is that given the prompt data sets, they sample many prompts to fine tune the initial language model. And then they can generate some text, which is output of the initial language model. Then people will be involved in the process in terms of giving scores to this text and uh, do some ranking, such as which one is better than others, then this can be viewed as a score, as a reward. And based on sample and the reward pairs, they can train a model to optimize the, prefer the preference. And therefore the initial language model can be updated. This figure also showcases the detailed process. Then, the general idea is that given this prompt data set and the initial language model, we can leverage the RLHF to the text to improve the model parameter. I will skip the technical parts. And uh, I want to also mention that large language models can perform very well. One major reason is the huge model size. As you can see, for the early versions of BERT, like Albert and the uh, bird based model, this is the number of parameters in the million value at median level, right? So this is 110 million model parameters for the bird based model. But for GPT-3, I believe GPT-4 is also much more. 
than the GPT-3. You can see there's a huge jump in terms of model size. And this figure shows the development of large language models in the past few years. Starting from 2019, Google released the T5 model, and then GPT-4, sorry, GPT-3 was proposed uh, in 2020. After that, you can see many tech companies, they invest a lot to the training and the development of large language models. Here, the this, uh, so the, the ones in yellow color, highlighted by yellow color means that the models are open sourced. And I also want to mention beyond the large language models, there are also some large multi-model models. So GPT-4 is one of them. And meanwhile, there are some early ones such as Flamingo. It's also a model for dealing with multimedia data. This is one example, given input image, the model is able to answer the question such as, okay, this is dog. It, it, it first uh, describes the content of the image. And then if the user asks some question about this image, the model can give you some interesting and uh, most likely reasonable answers to the question. Okay, before I move to the next part, any questions? Okay, perhaps I can proceed and uh, leave the question at the end. So next part, I will quickly talk about the protein language models. So idea is very similar to language models we just introduced, but now we are not working on language, the human language, but the, the proteins. By the way, the slides for this section are mainly provided by Zhong Liang, which is a student co advised by Dr. Kenan and myself. For sequence embedding, it means that we can convert the sequence data as some real value the vectors or matrices. In this example, you can see we can use a matrix to represent uh, some human language. So each, each word, for example, each word could be a dense vector in this matrix. And uh, the motivation of using protein language model is very similar. Given a protein sequence, we can also produce some dense embeddings and uh, those embeddings can help us in some downstream applications. Like this one, if we want to embed uh, vectors, if we want to uh, achieve some embedding vectors to represent the biological sequences, then how can we represent the, the proteins? Let's see, this is a sequence of the protein, and this is a structure, 3D structure. What we want to achieve is also something like this, a dense embedding of real values, which represent the original protein sequence and also somehow indicate the structure of the sequence the, of, the, of the protein. And we may have multiple ways to do that. And uh, this is how we use different uh, embeddings to represent the protein. So this is actually very, the task here is very relevant to the language model we have just introduced. For language modeling, given a sentence, which is also a sequence of words, a sequence of, of tokens, we can use language model, just view it as a black box. And this black box can help us to predict the missing word. And uh, at the middle point, we can have the dense embeddings for the for the input words. And uh, this is a self-supervised learning process. We don't have to use any human labels for data. As you remember, we have the next sentence prediction, we have max language modeling. For all of them, it's very easy and cheap to generate uh, some labels for self-supervised self learning. And similarly, for the protein sequence, we can also ask the model to predict the missing one. Or even for the complete sequence, we can use idea like language model to do the prediction, to predict the sequence from itself. And during this process, we will, we will be able to get some dense embeddings for the protein sequence. And within the language model, we can follow some generous structure of transformer, right? It could have encoder, decoder. And uh, here, the last layer of the encoder network could be used as embedding for the input protein sequence. This is how we 
get the embedding from the language model. And uh, here, if we have the input protein sequence, then each, re each residual could be viewed as, could be represented by one column of the dense matrix. In other words, this column is corresponding to F, this is corresponding L. Okay, then currently there are already many existing protein language models. I list a number of them as example, such as ESM based models uh, developed by Meta AI and some others such as Protein Bird and ProTrans. Here, this figure shows the general idea of ESM1B, which is one version of the ESM model. As you can see, the model is pre-trained using 250 million protein sequences sampled from all organisms. And uh, the training process is very similar to what we have learned so far for the mask language modeling. And they use a masked input sync, masked input sequence to, to train the model. Here you can see this is the sequence of the protein and uh, some positions has been maxed out. Then the model has over, about uh, 650 million parameters. And uh, they also, also discussed uh, the application of this sequence. For example, here you can you get the score for that. So this is just a very general overview of the ESM1B protein language model. As you can see, in terms of model training, it's very similar to the language model for human language. The only difference is that input sequence are different. And the one more thing here is a figure for another model by Meta AI, it's ESM1B. And here you can see that for pre-training, it's a one-time thing. And ESM1V has a very good capability for zero-shot learning. And the input data for pre-training is a sequence database of protein sequences. And it does not require the sequence alignment beforehand. Okay, I will just skip it. Then this figure, this table is from a recent survey paper. It's a survey about uh, the protein language models. And uh, as you can see here, it's a very comprehensive list of existing protein language models for different purposes. Some of them are used for the sequence embedding, but some others are used for the 3D structure prediction. And uh, the ESM based ones are here and also some other ones you can hear, here you can see the different uh, training styles, different uh, architectures, uh, backbone models. Most of them are based on transformers and some of them are based on the GPT or BERT models. And this column shows the parameter size. Let's see, I think the ESM2 might be the largest model so far because model parameter is about uh, 15, b 15 billion. Okay. And then the last column shows the database used to pre-train the language model, the protein, protein language model. Okay. Then once you have the protein language model, you can do a lot of interesting things, such as performing some predictive model, predictive modeling or exploratory data analysis. For predictive modeling, you can simply view the dense embeddings from, you have, for example, you have the, all the models here, they are pre-trained, meaning that you don't have to fine tune them or you don't have to make any changes of the model parameters, unless you really want to. Then you can use that as the off-the-shelf tool and get embeddings for your own data. And then you can imagine you will have a better starting point for predictive modeling. Then you can also perform some exploratory data analysis based on the embeddings. By using those embeddings, you can use the UMAP, TSNI, or tree structures to represent the data you have and try to identify if there are any interesting biological insights from that. That's why in the next part, I will briefly introduce several of our recent papers for the protein analysis. These are 
the work are mainly done by our students Zhong Liang and Willen in the past two years, and it's a collaboration with Dr. Cannon's lab. Here, the first product is called the false former, and uh, our task is to predict, can we train, our task is to train model to predict which candies can phosphorylate uh, which substrate. In the data set, we will have these pairs and then we'll ask the model to predict the corresponding one. Here you can see the objective and the data set used in our paper. And we have the candies domain sequence. For example, we have over 24,000 unique candy substrate sequences pairs spanning 800 unique candies from 13 organisms. And we have those positive pairs. Meanwhile, we created some negative samples by using the STY sets with no evidence of the phosphorylation. Then our approach contains three stages. We have the pre-training stage by using the language model. We use the, our data to pre-train the model. And then we will use the pre-train model as a starting point. And for a given candy sequence, we can we can use the uh, we can do the fine tuning for this task. And finally, we evaluate the model and uh, try to investigate the, how to explain the model results. This is architecture of our model. We have the two stages, pre-training and fine-tuning. For the pre-training stage, we follow the very standard mask language modeling idea to do pre-training. Given the data space we have, we have the initial set of protein sequences. Then we tokenize them as a pre-processing and then perform the random masking on the sequences. So given the masked sequences, we will use transform model to predict the complete and masked sequences. In this process, we use the cross entropy loss to update model weights. So this is a pre-training stage. We don't have any specific consideration of the kinase sequence or any, uh, we don't have any positive negative pairs involved in this process. But for the fine-tuning stage, we will perform the kinase specific phosph phosphor set prediction. Here you can see the idea is that this model, the pre model will be used as a starting point here. And then we use the new inputs after tokenization as the peptide and kinase pairs as new input. Then we use focal loss to do prediction. The quantitative results show that our model performs much better than all the previous ones. And we have we have done much more comprehensive evaluations compared with all the others. As you can see, some of them, they don't provide us corresponding results. And even more, if you look at some UMAP visualizations of our model, we can generate interesting clusters according to the different uh, Kinesis substrate pairs. Okay, we also realized the model results after different stage. That's the first project. For the second project, we look at the alignment-free conservation estimation. Previous work, I just want to mention some key, key ideas and uh, key insights from the paper. And I believe Dr. Kanda and Zhong Liang, they can explain more details about the work to the audience. So the key idea is that previous work, they mainly rely on, uh, they mainly require alignment to perform conservation estimation. But in our work, we try to leverage protein language model and perform alignment-free conservation estimation. That's the key idea. And uh, we have a data set here, which is uh, over 11,000 elements. Then we have a large number of aligned residues for us to train the model. We try different uh, pre-trained language models protein language models and see that ESM2, the largest one, usually perform better than the other competitors. And for the quantitative re results, such as by Pearson correlation, we have observed a better correlation than or comparable ones than other models. 
for different models, we can see the comparisons by the, let's see, for ES, ESM2, the largest model, I believe this is the highest result, 0 0.72 and 0 0.75. This is uh, aligned with our estimation and aligned with our, our, our expectation because the larger model can give you more meaningful embeddings for predicting the conservation. Okay, and we also have more analysis in the paper. I will skip that. Then the last project is about uh, realizing the protein sequence embedding in the trees. We believe that it's interesting idea to design new tools to realize the embeddings. And uh, one, in, one approach is to use the trees. Previously, people used UMAP or TSNI to realize embedding in 2D space, but they cannot tell you some interesting biological phenomena such as evolution. And here, in our work, we try to design the trees to realize the protein embeddings. Let's say we have the unaligned sequences, then given the protein language model, we can get the full set embeddings. Then based on embeddings, we can have the uh, distance matrix. From distance matrix, we can generate the trees to realize the relationships among those input sequences. Okay, based on the tree realization, we can see some advantages of that, such as better accuracy. And we also, another interesting point of our paper is that we can estimate the branch support using variation autoencoder. So this is a very interesting point to help us produce more reliable tree structure for the input sequence. Okay, due to the limited time, I want to talk more about the future directions. I have one more page here. So lastly, I want to discuss some challenges and the future direction in this area, according to my own understanding. There are some open problems and the future directions. First, we know that the largest uh, protein language model, ESM2, is still, it, it's already big enough, such as uh, 15 billion parameters. But compared with other large models in language domain, it's still not large enough. So I believe there's still a big potential to scale up the language models. It's a very straight, straightforward and uh, uh, promising way to do that. The second idea, second direction, I would say, if we can incorporate the domain knowledge to the model training or fine tuning of the protein language model, it should be very meaningful. Right now, the training of language model is simply following the idea of training human language models. Right? We use the mask language model as our objective function to train the protein language model and get the, get the embedding. So everything is from, also, most of the training ideas are borrowed from the natural language process domain. But I believe for the protein language domain, there are a lot of physical knowledge, biological knowledge that could be leveraged to further improve the training of the protein language model. The third one is to improve the interpretability of protein language models. Different than other domains, I think it's more important to have sufficient explanations for the protein language model, especially for the very, very high stake application like drug design, drug discovery, right? If you can provide more evidence, more cues to interpret the results, that would be very meaningful. The next one is to design new mechanisms to enable the interactions among multiple protein language models. There are some ongoing efforts to uh, understanding or promoting the interaction among multiple large language models or large language model agents. I think something similar should be useful for protein language model as well. If we have multiple protein language models, they have their own strengths, their own focuses. But if you can design some automatic way to help them interact with each other and generate a more meaningful outputs for one application, that's something very interesting. The next one is developing auto ML pipeline for various downstream applications. So I think this is, becomes more uh, reasonable nowadays than before because of the capability of large, large protein language model. Given the capability of protein language model, I think uh, we have a very good starting point to perform many downstream applications.
But still, if you want to design or if you want to train a model for predictive analysis, it still involves a lot of human choices, human design choices. So for example, which loss function we want to use, just like the question we discussed earlier, right? Which loss function we use, which activation function we want to use. But if you can leverage the large model as starting point and design some auto ML pipeline to help you automatically optimize those design choices. And if you only focus on interpreting and uh, understanding the insights discovered from the model, then I think this is also interesting pipeline to study. And next one is to design effective solutions to fully exploit the multi-source heterogeneous data. I, I believe the heterogeneity in bioinformatics is also very, very important issue. And in, in other domains such as computer science, people try to design unified multi-model model to, to uh, capture multiple modalities from different sources, such as audio, video, sensory data, language, images, right? Then for the protein language model, or in general for bioinformatics, how could we effectively deal with multi-source heterogeneous data? I think I, 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 I don't see any effective solution for now, but I believe there will be future, future work on that. And uh, last but not the least, I think for every domain, it's highly important to have uh, some large scale, well established benchmarks for evaluation so that we can compare models more fairly and uh, more convincingly. I, so in a recent discussion with another uh, PhD applicant, she told me that, okay, she read a paper, but they also show a table with some numerical values. Their method is much better than the other baseline, but he found that they use different uh, training test sets. So I think this is very, very uh, common in, in some papers, but it's not fair for comparison. I believe if, if we can have something like ImageNet for the bioinformatics domain, then everything becomes standardized and we can they can they can be helpful in promoting the development of new solutions in this area. And finally, I want to acknowledge my collaborators, uh, Dr. Cannon, and my student, our student Zhong Liang, and also other members from Cannon Lab. We work together on the papers I just introduced. Okay, thank you all. Any questions? Questions? Should be questions. Okay, while students are thinking about the questions, you know, Sheng, maybe uh, elaborate a little bit on what, what do you think would be sort of good sort of future directions? You know, you mentioned uh, that, you know, integrating language models with other heterogeneous data sources, um, you know, would be a, a really powerful way to kind of you know, improve uh, or, or, you know, improve the application of these language models for bioinformatics applications. But uh, what, what are some of the new, new, you know, uh, advances in, in that area, uh, particularly with, with integrating language models and knowledge graphs? So, or, you know, you, you know, if you could comment on that, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, there are different approaches, for example, for the multiple modalities of data, I think some researchers, they try to, they try to design unified embeddings for, for data. So the idea is that for different uh, input modalities that like images, videos, audio, or something else, they try to design a unified way to create a dense embedding for all of them. And uh, after that, they can, they, can, they can view all the things equivalently and train the model. That's one thing. And for the other part of, of your question about the incorporation of knowledge graph to language model, I think there are some interesting ongoing studies on that direction as well. As you know, the language models, they really have the uh, very serious issue of generating realistic but fake knowledge. Something looks very, very reasonable, but if you look at detail, they are not true then how could we leverage the factor knowledge from knowledge graph to 
ground the outputs of generative models, including large models, is a very interesting direction. In other words, we could have controlled the generation of language models to make sure that the model can only give you factor knowledge, not the false knowledge. I think this kind of capability is more important for areas in healthcare, in biology, and uh, other life saving scenarios. Okay, yeah, good. Yeah. Hi, thanks for the great presentation. Uh, about the embedding matrix, uh, I got two understandings from the slides. Uh, first, simply, uh, 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 you are mapping each residue to a vector in a high dimensional space. And the second one was uh, we pick one residue plus some meta information about its role in the protein structure and then uh, create embedding matrix. Was the second, my second understanding true? Have you done it? Um, I, I don't think so. I, I think we, Given the input of protein sequence, we only need to use it as input and uh, then we can run the model and uh, get the density embedding. That's all. We don't have to go back to check the sequence again. For example, in this case, we I want to show you another example here. Well, let's see. Maybe this one. So given this, input as protein sequence, then the protein language model will help produce a dense matrix. And uh, each column in this example correspond to a uh, residue from the input sequence. And let me ask yeah. in this way, if you have more experience in this field, do you think uh, it could be possible, a good idea to add some uh, information about the protein folding to build yep. and not not this uh, uh, matrix, some other new matrix. Do you see it possible? Yeah, 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 I think that's possible. So that's actually a very interesting way to, uh, in my understanding, a very interesting way to incorporate domain knowledge, right? So when you want to incorporate the domain knowledge to the model training and fine tuning, I think that's also one interesting way to explore. You have the initial embedding from protein language model, but the protein language model only relies on the sequential information to generate embeddings. If you have additional information, additional knowledge, and it can complement the embedding you have. That's a good idea. Yeah, so just to reiterate that point, I think this is something that the speakers uh, yesterday also reiterated. Like you don't have to train the models from scratch anymore, right? So at least for bioinformatics applications, it's just fine tuning these models with specific data sets that you're interested in. So, so the applications that uh, Dr. Lee mentioned was just sort of fine tuning existing language models to ask questions related to the specific domain of interest, which is in our case, you know, how do you understand, how do you make the model understand the language of protein kinases and how they phosphorylate substrates, right? So you could be thinking about potential ways to fine tune the model for your applications, you know, it, it could be, you know, on classifying cancer genomes or, uh, you know, or any, 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 other, any other topic. So, so you could think about ways in which you could use the existing model to fine tune on your data sets. But the important thing is you really need to understand the biology and have a working knowledge of these language models, because that's the only way you're gonna be able to fine tune the models. And, and that also relates to the data augmentation strategies and, and all the other uh, things that Dr. Uh, Lee mentioned, all of this requires uh, a deep uh, knowledge of the biology as well as a working understanding of the language model. So, so I think uh, with that summary, uh, maybe this would be a good time to take a break. Uh, uh, Cheng, uh, thank you again. Let's let's give Dr. Lee a big round of applause. Thank you, thank you all for your time and attention. Uh, Thank you. So we'll reconvene in, in an hour after lunch. Uh, and now we'll shift gears in the afternoon to look at single cell data analysis. Uh, so uh, thanks, uh, Shane. Thanks for um, you know, your time. And uh, I'll be in touch. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Let's keep in touch. Bye-bye. Okay.
Bye bye. Should I start or still wait for? I don't know, but it's better than that. So it's really bad. Twenty seconds. So we can uh, go to your people. We have the all 10 minutes for, for people to ask questions. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, cool. We are going to start the afternoon section of our workshop. And uh, again, we have Dr. Jiang Hu uh, that's going to talk about how to do statistical analysis for NGS data. And I asked him to make sure, make sure the goal is low to cover the basic so that you guys can follow. But if, if you guys feel too easy, let him know. He can make it, uh, he can give you guys more formulas, okay? <laughs> Thank you. I think you all know me because I presented yesterday and uh, most of you look tired. <laughs> I think if you don't look tired, that means you didn't pay much attention to the previous workshop. <laughs> but I'm, I'm not going to grade you on the mathematical formulas and uh, for, one comment for the previous workshop is very useful about a lot of things about the machine learning parts. But if you, it's difficult to understand, then that's the nature of artificial, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning. That is the nature of it. It starts from statistics. You need, if you want to understand or study AI or machine learning, you need to know these formulas. So you can from, tell from my title, statistical analysis. So what is the relationship between statistical analysis, artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, all these things, why they are related? So first is um, machine learning is definitely not something magical. You can tell from the previous workshop, I think you go through uh, recurrent neural networks, convolutional neural networks, all these things, they, they have a name called machine learning. And if you have a super large model with a lot of layers, it's called deep learning. And all of this machine learning, deep learning, all of these things, they belong to a statistic. As you know, the ReLU function, sigmoid function, I hope you still remember. So there's nothing magic. So people always ask me, for example, one physician asked me, can I ask ChatGPT to do some diagnosis if I give, give it the personal information? My question is, first, you don't know about these models. The answer is definitely no, because these models, they're just regressions. If they don't know, they will make up some idiot or very full answers to you with fake reference. So if you know of, the, of this model, of this statistical thing, you will have a better sense of how we can utilize these models in our daily life. So usually for me, I only use ChatGB to, to, to revise my email. Other than that, I don't trust it anymore. So going back here, if many people are claiming that I, I'm in the AI initiative at Emory, and we have a big cohort, people from law school, economy school, business school, statistical school, mathematics school. They are all claim, they all claim that they are doing something related to AI. But if you want to conduct research in AI, only people with a background of mathematics or statistics, they can do AI. Other people are doing AI related topics because they don't understand the details. So that's why for today's topic, I'm thinking about maybe I should make a more attractive topic like. AI for next generation sequencing data analysis, but to me, that is not professional. I will still say statistics. Everything came from statistics. And there's another joke, like people who don't good at math, they turn to statistics. <laughs> That's the second part. So today you can see 
there is no, in most of the universities or colleges, there is no specific major called AI because AI is not something, for, for example, if you ask people what you're, you're studying, the people answer, I study AI. So the, the answer is kind of like similar to I study science. There's no major called science. You need to find one application, AI in language model, AI in genomics, AI in other parts. So today I'm talking about the application of statistical analysis in next generation sequencing data. And the statistical model include classical statistical models and some machine learning models, which we consider as AI. So this is the relationship I want you to make clear. So why statistic is related to AI, that is my understanding of it. So today's talk, I, I wanted to make it relaxing for you. So if you have any questions, just raise your hand. I can give you a quick answer. So about my own experience, I have been analyzing single cell and the spatial genomics data for six years. So I'm pretty experienced with all these things. And so today's workshop will be two parts. The first part, I will walk you through some of like, what is next generation sequencing data? What you can get from this type of data? And how should we, uh, is there any tricks in experimental design when we're trying to get this data? And in the second part, I will walk you through one analysis pipeline because usually for people from biomedics, when they're trying to analyze this type of data, they just follow the pipeline from SCANPI or, or, or SERAT. And then they just run through all the steps. Especially in the pre-processing, there are multiple steps. And for many people, they just don't understand it. And they just run all, go through all the steps they think is necessary. But for today's talk, I'm going to, to get the detail of why we're doing this step because of the data, how the data looks like. What if you do that, didn't do this step, what consequences you will have? So this is the goal of today's talk. Uh, before we go to the analysis part, I want to get uh, some understanding of the next generation sequencing data. So next generation sequencing data, people will ask, what is the, what is the previous next generation of sequencing data, right? So the previous sequencing data, the first generation sequencing data came from the Human Genome Project, which started in uh, 1990s to 1990s, uh, 2006. In this type of technique, they are uh, DNA sequencing data techniques to measure the whole human genome. So they measure, they, they get the sequence of the whole DNA. And that is the first generation. And for the next generation sequence data, it started in middle to, uh, 2000 and to present. So the difference is that is a high throughput sequencing data. It can quickly and uh, with a low cost to parallel measuring the D, both the DNA and RNA. So that is the next generation of sequencing data. So, but it's called next generation sequencing data, but there are two generations. There are, uh, the, the, I would say the second generation is called short reads next generation sequence data. They are, they're considered as the second generation sequencing data. And the third generation data is called long reads next generation sequencing data, which is more adopted. When you heard words like single cell RNA sequencing, spatial transatomics, it's all the third generation of the sequencing. And within the long reads next generation sequencing data, there are like two different types. The first type is real time long read sequencing data. And the, the second type is the synthetic long read sequence data, which includes the single cell RNA sequencing came from Illumina or TNX genomics. So what is the difference between the next generation and the first generation, which considered as a single sequence data? First is it's higher sensitivity to detect low frequency variants, and it is faster for high sample volumes. And it will also comprehensively uh, measure the genome cover have the comprehensive genome coverage and the higher capacity with the sample multiplexing. And it is able to sequence thousands of genes simultaneously. So you can see the high throughput sequencing data refers to next generation sequencing data. So uh, I'm not an expert in the wild lab experiment, but let me show you how they do the sequencing part because this is related to the different bioinformatic steps in analyzing the data. So first is for sample preparation. We have sample from different conditions, tumors and normal, and then, is then isolate the RNAs and extract the RNA based on their poly A tail. And then they generate the cDNA uh, library from the, R the mRNAs and using sequencing to get different reads. As you can see here, there are many uh, RNA reads. So then we, they want to map this small fragments RNA reads to the whole genome so they know that which gene this RNA belongs to. So that's why we first need to have the DNA sequence. So we have a genome reference and then you observe the small fragments, you know how to map these fragments back and then you know the expression level of each. So most of the next generation sequence data are performed on 
model animals, which include human, mice, macaque, and bat, and penguins, or some of them, because they need to have a reference. So if you want to do single cell RNA sequencing for uh, some animal, I don't know, but they don't have a reference, then you need, you need to consider, first, we need to generate a reference, and then you can do single cell RNA sequencing. So that's why it has its own limitation. So for today's contents, next generation sequencing data contain two parts, DNA and RNA parts. But we will focus more on RNA sequencing compared to the DNA sequencing. And in RNA sequencing, there are bulk RNA sequencing, single cell RNA sequencing, and the most popular one, spatial transcriptomics. So what, one question people ask is why we don't talk about DNA sequencing compared to RNA sequencing. The answer is going back to look at the century dogma. Usually it came from the DNA and DNA chromosome open and then translated to RNA. And some of the RNA are coding RNA and non-coding RNA and some of the RNA then translated to protein. So during this process, usually for human being for his entire life, his DNA will not change much. So it's a static, but the RNA since it expressed at a different region, for example, for infant, for baby, its RNA expression level is definitely different from adults. So the expression level of RNA will definitely give you a more dynamic picture of the whole uh, the genome's activity. But most of, and most of the uh, biological interactions are happening at the protein level. And then people ask, why are you not measuring protein rather than looking at RNA? So my answer is twofold. First is RNA is more comprehensive. You know that RNA has coding RNA and non-coding RNA. And the coding RNA will be translated to protein, while non-coding RNA, sometimes they have some other functions like ribosome or other functions they are like a, a, in some interactions. So RNA has more comprehensive picture of the whole parts. A second reason that measuring protein is expensive. As I said, for next generation sequencing data, it can cover the whole genome. But for RNA and measure, for protein measurements, usually you need to get some antibodies with a pre-designed panel and you can only measure 30, 50, or a few hundreds of proteins of your own interest. If your research is want to do a discovery study, for example, you have disease versus normal, but you don't know which gene driven this difference, you want to check the whole genome. So that's why RNA sequencing right now is the most popular way people are studying, at least to my side, RNA is more popular. So as I said, after you, in, in, the, in, the, in a data processing step, you will have different fragments of small RNAs, and then you're trying to align this RNA to a reference, which may came from the DNA parts. So the very first step in RNA sequencing analysis, usually done by biomedicians, is the alignment. For example, here, you have a reference data set. This reference is coming from maybe the first, round, uh, first generation sequence data, you have the DNA. And then what you have observed are the small reads, small fragments. For example, this one may be a gene. And then if you count these two parts all measured to this region, so this gene has an expression level of two. But in this uh, RNA, RNA alignment, there are some statistical questions which we take, a, take, a, take, a, take into account. First is, if you look at this uh, nucle uh, nucleotide here, the reads here is the same. So if we identify these reads, our methods will give you 99% that we are pretty much confident sure this read one came from this gene. But there are some semantic mutations, right? But they will not change a large proportion of the reads, but in some of the nucleotides, they will change the, change, the, um, change the type. For example, in read two here, which should be C here, but it in fact is a T. But when you're trying to map the second reads back onto the reference, maybe only 90% of the reads are, are mapped to the reference and 10% of them are lost. So even reads, when you're trying to do the examination, whether this variance, this, this mutation will change the expression level, you will get biased results. For example, they all expressed at the same level, but because of the, the mapping bias, you will get the conclusion that reads one, the first type of mutation has higher expression level than reads two. This is the problem of the alignment because of the mutation parts. And people are going to solve that. I'm going to go into a statistical method to get prepared, but no details about that part. So there's a method uh, developed called WASP. I have used it when I just started my PhD. It's trying to solve this issue. And its solution is pretty much simple. That means have, we have a reference data set and, and we have two types of reads mapped to this region. And we identify that reads one, there are two types of reads, reads one and reads two, they are mapped to the, the reference step. Even reads two, or some of them are lost. And then 
by doing the mapping step, we have detect that there may be potential mutation of this region. So then we generate the second type of reference and do the mapping again. For example, in the second type of the reference, you can see we change the C to T, right? And for reads one, it will have a decreased reference a mapping ratio, but we don't look at reads one. We just use the previous result in the first round of mapping. But for the second type of reads, it about has a reads mapping ratio of 99%. So we map up again and then combine the result of two, two rounds of mapping, we get a more accurate results. This is how biomathematicians solve this type of question. It is statistical rigorous. There are different tests. I'm trying to give you a high level understanding because you know that from the reference, how we generate the second round of reference, right? You cannot like make sure we are always that dynamic mutation with, so we always like try different set of reference. There are some statistical rigorous methods to that, but the basic idea of this paper is to generate multiple reference based on your own data sets. Okay, so then, then we go to the bulk, the single cell, uh, the angle sequencing techniques. There are a few types of angle sequencing techniques. The first one, which is developed very earlier and I want to go over, is called bulk angle sequencing. So bulk angle sequencing has also also have two types: the real bulk or cell type bulk. In real bulk, we just uh, pick up the whole tissue region, and this tissue sample it may contain here as shown here, it may contain more than hundred cells, and then. We, we, we just sequence all the cells, extract all their mRNAs and do the sequencing. And for this one sample, we have one reads for each gene. For example, here, we may find that for gene one, this whole sample have expression of some number. But this is a mixture of different cell types, which has a limited usefulness. The second type of bulk and sequencing is cell type specific. That means they, they have some antibodies or some other techniques to pull out a specific cell, cell type from the tissue section. For example, we get 100 cells, but all these cells belong to T cell, and then we do the sequencing. And for the same similar tissue, we can pull out the B cells and then do the sequencing. But for here, each sample here in this gene expression matrix, each row will be a cell type, and each column is a gene. So I feel like if you want to get some cell type specific expression, you should definitely choose the cell type, cell type specific bulk carbon sequencing. So one question or one uh, potential task in bulk cell, single cell, uh, bulk RNA sequencing data is definitely, as you can imagine, is to do deconvolution. We observed the, the expression of a bulk which may contain 100 cells from different cell types. And then we want to separate their expression into cell type specific. So in this inference part, it contains two results. First is, what is the proportion of different cell types within this bulk? And the second is, for each cell type, what is their cell type specific gene expression signature? So there is a statistical method called non-negative matrix factorization to get this result. So the key idea based on that is that we have, for example, if we go here, we start from this matrix with row correspond to samples and column comes from month genes. And then we want to get two matrix. One matrix represents the cell type proportion. Another matrix represents the cell type specific gene expression. And you can see, for proportion, it ranges from zero to one. So it's all non-negative values. And also for the gene expression, it's non-negative values. So that's why it's kind of a statistical question. If we have one matrix, it's all positive values, how to separate them into two matrix, the multiple, multiple result of two, two matrix, which all the values in the two resulting matrix are also non-negative values. So there is a statistical method called non-negative matrix factorization for this type of work. So this is the task of bulk cell on bulk on sequencing deconvolution. Okay, so as single cell on sequencing is becoming more adopted, many, many studies are using this technique. But I want to make a comments on the single cell on sequencing versus the bulk on sequencing. Some people ask me whether bulk on sequencing should be dropped. It's, it's out of date because we have single cell on sequencing. The, the answer is definitely no we still need bulk RNA sequencing. For example, a few reasons bulk RNA sequencing has a much long, large number of cells than single cell RNA sequencing. And bulk sequencing can profile many samples from different disease condition and its cost is low. So for example, as shown here, we have a mouse brain and your mouse brain have a 3D structure, have many, many cells. Usually for single cell RNA sequencing, you can only get a very small proportion of it and it gets sequenced but it may lose the whole picture. But for bulk RNA sequencing, 
you will get more all the cells, but their expression resolution is low. It's kind of like you want to do a questionnaire to a school. Single cell amino sequencing is trying to find one class and send each student a, a questionnaire and ask their answers. But box sequencing is that we can do a, a, a questionnaire for all the students in the school, but for each class, we will get one answer. So that's why both parts are needed. And there are many studies trying to deconvolute the bulk RNA sequencing using single cell RNA sequencing. So both of them are useful in our research, even right now. OK, so I think I have uh, give, you, give you a picture of the technique of RNA sequencing, next generation sequencing, and what are their applications, how, what disease people are trying to utilize them to study. So the first, uh, a little bit of history, the type two bio diabetes is the disease field that has adopted single cell RNA sequencing since the earliest stage of the development of this technology. So in 2016, there are six studies using single cell RNA sequencing and the number of cells they measured start from less than 100 and then to 2000, 2002. And right now at this stage, I think the single cell RNA sequencing can easily go beyond 10,000, 10, I feel. So in this study, their computational results show that the power of cell type resolve analysis and reveal that cell type specific gene expression programs, subpopulations, and transcriptal alternations in type 2 diabetes. So it can give you the cell type level molecular information. And also of my interest, they have application to Alzheimer's disease. In 2019, masses collected single cell and sequencing data from the cortex of 80 uh, southern cells from 48 individuals with varying degrees of AD pathology. And they identify transcriptome di distinct subpopulations and cell type specific disease associated with gene expression. So you can see this data, they have grown exponentially and they have multiple samples. So it's an art to how to choose these samples. You want to have some disease, some normal, so you can do the comparison. So in this study, the relative large number of subjects enabled the investigation of sex effect on AD for the first time. So they have male and female, and then do the comparison. They find that I think their conclusion is that female has some uh, difference compared to, to male in the, AD, in the AD part in the molecular expression data. And cancer is all, always the popular topic. So single cell genomic seen cancer research is also very important. It, it, it is even more adopted because cancer cell populations are subjected to high mutation rates. So they change a lot and they show high epigenetic plastic making tumor cell population heterogeneous and sensitive to selective pressures. So understanding the landscape of genetic and epigenetic heterogeneity, as well as the downstream effect of expression and cell state is crucial to better uncover the tumor initiation and progressions. So a lot of studies are used for cancer study. But as you, we can see that this talk is focused on next generation sequencing. Next generation sequencing also have DNA sequencing techniques, right? And people care about DNA sequencing because in cancer, because as I said, DNA is more static, but in tumor, DNA is not static anymore. They have a lot of mutations. So in 2011, Nevin conducted the first single cell DNA sequencing study in the cancer, cancer cells collected from two breast cancer patients. And in 2021, we first time show that the single cell ataxic, which measures the chromatin accessibility, can be used to study cancer colon evolution. And the Kim in 2020 collected uh, 208,000 cells from cutaneous and non-cutaneous lung tissue, used this technique to map the trajectory of normal epithelial cells towards the malignant cell state in, in lung cancer. So they have this specific study design. They have a lot of collected a lot of data from sample different cancer stages, so they can reconstruct the whole trajectory. So single cell data is never you have one data set from one patient and do some analysis. When the, the scale of single cell data become larger and larger, people are trying to get more ideas on the study design. And study design right now is the trick for many studies. <coughs> so single cell can approach um, in, uh, in, in, spatial uh, in cancer study, they can help us to understand the tumor initialization, progression, and multiple studies has used single cell RNA sequencing to identify 
tumor progenerative cells and uh, to study their transition towards malignant cell states. And you can see here, this is a picture of the tumor micro-involvement. There are tumor cells, tumor epithelial, immune cells, um, including dendritic cell, B cell, T cell. So, so also another, uh, another direction people are really looking at is the immune cells. How many first is, what is the proportion of the immune cells in your cancer tissue? And are they activated or not? So this technique, to summarize, is a powerful tool for diagnosis and prognosis in human diseases, particularly in tumor. Hydrogenity may underline different survival and response to therapies. So this technique is very important. So let's come to the part of study design. If we have no um, barrier on like a collected data, what type of sample you are going to choose? So study design, well, as you can see in this figure, a very simple idea is that we collect some data from disease and control and then combine them together, do the comparison of the cell types, and then we will find some disease-associated cell types or disease-associated cell states. And then we look into their expression, we will have a better understanding of it. But there are a lot of statistical tricks in this study design. And something we should take into account, first is the sample selection, how we are going to select sample, right? For example, we have, if we study breast cancer, we study the breast cancer patients. We have five of them and how many normal samples we should include. And the second is the number of cells and the sequencing depths per cell we should consider. For example, in single cell data, each sample, how many cells you are going to collect? It is directly related to the cost. A thousand or 10,000, what makes the difference, right? And the sequencing depths. That means for each cell, how many transcripts you want to identify. Definitely higher the, the sequencing depths, more the cost. So you need to consider that. And the third part is the sample collection design to mitigate batch effect. So batch effect is something people always want to reduce, but it's inevitable. Batch effect came from many reasons. For example, one people uh, generate data in the third floor, another people generate the same data in the second floor, there will be some batch effect. Because people who do the same, they have some difference. It's hard to detect, but batch effect, keep in mind, we can try to remove batch effect, but batch effect will always present. It's inevitable. So how to do the study design to mitigate the batch effect is the art. And the last thing we need to consider is the cost. How should, how should we reduce the cost? It's always the issue. So we will go to each part separately. First is sample selection. There are two types of sample selection. First is based on their population genetic risk factors. For example, we have a genetic factor here, and for all this sample, we know their DNA sequencing. So we can separate them into a low risk group, middle risk group, and a high risk group based on their genetic profile. So by comparing samples selected from this study, we are able to identify genetic risk factors that are enriched or decreased in a specific cell type in these samples. We will identify cell type specific genes that are associated with genetic risk factors. The second one is more, uh, it's easier because we have a general population and we don't have their genotype information, but we have the phenotype. And as you see that phenotype is not a discrete or clear thing. Phenotype can be continuous as you can see here, it's a continuous color. So then we can order the samples based on their phenotype. And then we may select for each dot, we select the extreme ones, the pretty low one, the pretty high one, the darker one, or the lighter one, and some of the in middle ones. By doing this study design, we can identify disease relevant cell types and identify cell type specific genes that are associated with a phenomatic change. So these are the most common ideas of how we do the study design. Okay, another part is the number of cells and the sequencing depths we are gonna choose, right? How we are going, first is, if we choose different number or different sequencing depths, how it's gonna, re, how, how it's gonna affect our result. First is, in many single cell data, in many, or in many diseases, when you try to decide how many cells you are going to sequence, usually people care what really affects this, this decision is the real cell types, because people are care about real cell types. For, for example, in tumor tissue, we do the sequencing, you should consider how many immune cells I can capture. If you capture, for example, you just do subsampling for a very small proportion, most of the cells you get are, are tumor epithelial. And you only get one T cell, five B cell, which is, has limited power. So it depends on how many real cell types they are and what are their frequency as shown here. This is a cell type proportion. 
and we have most of the domination of naive CD4, 8 T cell and CD4 T cell. But if your research want to focus on dendritic cell, which is a dark purple here, their proportion are pretty much low. So that means you should decide the number of cells you are going to choose based on the frequency or the, pre, the, pro, um, the proportion of the dendritic cells. You don't care about other cell types. To reliably identify real cell types, a large number of cells is needed. Thus, the number of cells per subject is largely determined by the frequency of really the cell type of interest. And this is a statistical question. A lot of statistical softwares are developed to estimate the number of cells that must be sampled in a single cell experiment based on the information, the prior knowledge. And in general, there are two strategies. For example, if, if you want to identify some real cell type, there are two general strategies. First is it's pretty shallow sequencing of the high numbers of cells per individual. And the second is the high, uh, the high sequencing depths, but a very limited number of cells. These are two types of design panels. But people have shown that the first strategy, which has a relatively low sequencing depth, but a larger number of cells works really well in most of the study designs, right? I think, as promised, there is no statistical formulas. <laughs> Before I have another, another slide to show you how should we do the power calculation, but I, I just uh, jumped in. So imagine we have solved all the problems. You have selected the samples and you, uh, determine the number of cells and you determine the sequencing depths, then we generate the data. Then we have batch effects. So I'm going to show you what batch effect looks like. Single cell data is very vulnerable for batch effect because, uh, so firstly, what, what is batch effect refers to? It re refers to the systematic difference among samples produced in different batches. This difference may refer to different platforms, different labs, different time points, Many things you can think about, but you're not, not, never going to crack that. So here is a, a visualization of two samples. For one has strong batch effect, another one has very minimal batch effect. As you can show here on the figure on the left, we have samples from A1 to H2, A samples. And if you do a dimensional reduction and trying to visualize them, if you see this pattern, most of the cells colored by the, the samples they are generated are pretty much well mixed with, with each other. That means there is minimal batch effect. Another difference is a stronger batch effect, which you can see that all these samples are separated by the sample they came from. That means the mean variance of the data is dominated by the sample difference rather than the cell type difference. So if you saw data like this, it's a warning telling, telling you, before you do any analysis, try to do batch effect removal. But a batch effect removal you also have the risk of removing true biological signals. So if you saw data like that, a simple conclusion is that the data quality is low. So be cautious when you get any conclusion from this data. So there are many ways to kind of reduce the batch effect in the, in the analysis pipeline. We can do different statistical modeling, trying to correct the things in the data and make them comparable. But this is our job, biostatistic and biomedics job. What can we do? We are trying to ex mitigate the batch effect at the study design stage. Can we design a study to make the study itself robust to, to batch effect? So although batch effect can be minimized by completely randomized uh, experimental design, such designs are often infeasible for studies that involve, hu involve human tissues because practically, the, the tissue sample preparation will, be, will not be processed immediately to avoid the tissue degeneration. And furthermore, for studies that involve a large number of subjects, patients are recruited subsequently, and single cell experiments may spend several days, months, or years introducing systematic non-biological difference that can be confounded as in the biological environment. So it's first, your study design will definitely affect the batch effect issue. So there are two ways conducted, uh, proposed by Song et al. to uh, kind of remove the batch effect. The first thing is called ref reference panel, and the second is called a chain type design. They can reduce the impact of batch effect from the starting design stage. So under the reference panel design, one batch is required to include cells from all cell types to serve as the reference panel. This is easy to understand. We have one have a reference, a ground truth. And then for other types, we can map the current data to this reference and then make all the samples comparable. But this is infeasible because 
you need to have this reference the requirements of the reference batch that include all cell type, make it difficult to achieve in practice because in different patients, different samples, some sample may contain specific cell type and it, it is hard to find one sample which is so comprehensive. So this is always infeasible. So an alternative uh, approach is called, uh, is called chain type design. So it means if we have three samples, each of them, one, any pair of them will share at least the two cell types in common. This is the key idea of the chain type design, like a chain. Every, every two pair of them have some overlaps. And using these overlap cells, they are able to do the batch effect correction. A special form of this design is when two cell types are shared among all batches. And this is a situation that is easy to meet in real studies. And so they have mathematically proved that under these two experimental design, the biological variability can be separated from the batch effect itself. So as, as the people who help a lot of physicians and clinicians help analyzing their data, so statistical tool is definitely not magic. If you come to me with a lot of batch effect, I may not be able to remove them, but uh, if you can involve us in the experimental design stage, we will give you a better idea. So for anyone who here want to generate their data with large sample, definitely consult a biostatistic person, ask them how can we get a more robust and a scientific study design is very important. We are important, that's why we are paid here. So uh, the last part we should consider is the cost. Um, but compared to other techniques, I think the single cell RNA sequencing data is already pretty much uh, decreased during these years. But as I said, bulk RNA sequencing data is never out of date because you want a large number. If you want to cover, for example, in a, in a mouse brain, you want to cover the whole brain, or even in macaque brain, you want to cover the whole brain. You cannot do single cell RNA sequencing data for the whole macaque brain, right? You can do single cell RNA sequencing for some parts, but for other regions of the brain, you can do bulk RNA sequencing and then combine them together to get a whole picture of the macaque brain for some tissue that you cannot measure every cell. So integrative analysis of single cell and sequencing and the bulk and sequencing is a common task in our field. And there are a lot of statistical methods for this goal. Uh, yeah, so for here, uh, I listed a few methods that can estimate the cell type proportion, uh, and further analysis incorporate this proportion as covariance can infer the cell type specific gene expression in each data. Even for some of the subjects, only bulk RNA sequencing data are available. For example, the most uh, popular one, cyber sort by Newman from Stanford, and BSAT detects cell type integration QTL, cell composition QTL studies. So they, there are different tools for deconvolution. After deconvolution, they have different purpose like QTL or other type of studies. If you have a specific need, you can do a search. Okay, so uh, the estimated cell type proportion, usually we get the proportion estimation from the deconvolution. And this proportion can be used to compare the cell type composition between disease, the case, and the controls. And can determine whether certain cell types are increased or decreased in, a pro in, in proportion in disease status informed by understanding the disease pathology. So there are two types of things we can do. For example, in Alzheimer's disease, you can see on the left is a normal condition brain. And on the right is Alzheimer's disease. So firstly, the cell type proportion changes a lot. Some neurons are lost, some neurons are deactivated. And the second part is that even for the same type, cell type in the different disease status, their expression level may be changed. For example, some neurons are deactivated. They're, they are lost their synapse and they are not functioning really, really well. So cell type, is some, cell type composition is something you can compare, but the cell type specific gene expression change is something you can compare again. So there are two parts of us can study. So such analysis has detected the loss of beta cells in type two diabetes, an increase of disease associated malignant um, micro, uh, microglia in, in Alzheimer's disease and the increase of microglia in advanced age related uh, macular degeneration. So there are many uh, publications on good journals using single cell analysis data to do this type of comparison. Okay, let's go to the, my expertise parts, the part three, the analysis pipeline. So for single cell RNA sequencing data, this is a, a very brief overlook of the analysis pipeline. The first thing you get the data after you do the alignment, the first thing is to do quality control. 
you want to remove genes or remove cells that are not well captured. And after that, you can do some denoising. And other downstream stacks, uh, tasks involve dimension reduction, clustering, differential expression analysis, and the trajectory inference. I'll go over each part. This is an overlook. On the left, you have three, maybe you have three samples collected from these uh, samples of different conditions. And the first thing to do is you want to do some pre-processing, which include normalization, imputation of the missing values, and then you want to conduct a batch effect correction, as I mentioned before, and then do gene selection. So after all these pre-processing steps, you will have a combined data set have mo having multiple samples. And with this combined data set, you are going to conduct different tasks. For example, the clustering and, and annotation for each sample, you will get a cell type label. And then you look at the expression level change, comparing the disease and the control. And for some develop developmental tissues like embryo or healing tissue, you will do the trajectory analysis because you see there is a trajectory of the cell differentiating in, 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 in vivo. And you can also do pseudo time uh, inference to see the pseudo time difference between disease and control, how the cells are differentiated into different ways. So the very first step is dimension reduction. Before I go to the methods, why we need dimension reduction? As we said, one of the advantages of single cell analysis is that it can measure the whole genome. So usually in whole genome, human genome, after the filtering, we still have more than 10,000 genes. So imagine you have a few, sample, a few thousand of samples, but you have more than 10,000 genes. It's a pretty large matrix. And your, your analysis cannot utilize all the genes. If you utilize all the genes, any of the statistical model, regression model, random forest, machine learning model, they will not be able to handle it. So we are going to do dimension reduction. We want to pick up the utilized inform useful information. For example, if we get only three genes that are pretty much useful, then we can exclude all the others. So the final goal of this step is to do dimension reduction. And the dimension reduction have two steps. The first step is, I, I call it the feature selection. Feature selection means we have 10,000 genes. And then we find that 9,000 of them are not informative at all. We just drop all these 9,000 genes and use do a performance analysis in the remaining 1,000 genes. This is called feature selection. That means you only select the useful ones and drop others. And after you select the southern the genes, you still tell me, well, 1,000 is still a large number. Statistical model cannot hold it. So we are going to do some dimension reduction. Dimension reduction, you, after dimension reduction, you may only have 50 dimensions, 50 features. But this 50 dimension contain all the information in the southern genes. You still have all the 1,000 genes expression, not like the rest of 9,000, you just exclude, exclude them. You just try to concat them to combine them in a very condensed way. And many ways for dimension reduction in unsupervised manner. One thing is for PCA. So as you can see, formula on board if available. We don't have a board, so we don't need to go with the formula. But the key idea of the PCA dimension reduction, I want to use this figure to show here. For this figure, we have x, y, two dimensions. But if we want to distinguish all these spots here, maybe we're only using one dimension is good. So here you can see that if we only use one dimension, which is 45 degree here, x plus y, have, yeah, it stop at here. This angle, we will be able to distinguish these cells. So the dimension reduction key idea is that we utilize both x and y and project them to some platform that are determined by both x and y. And by doing so, we, re we reduce the dimension from two to one. Similar idea, you have 1,000 genes, we can reduce the dimension to 50, but also capture most of the relevance. You will definitely lose some of the information, but you capture most of them. That is the idea of dimension reduction. And after dimension reduction, we have a 50 dimensions, and then we can do some clustering. For example, let's imagine a three-dimensional space, and we only have three features. We can put those, these cells onto this three-dimensional space, and then we cal calculate their distance. And based on their distance, we see that they can be grouped into different clusters because they are close to each other. And then we separate them into eight clusters as shown here. This is called clustering analysis. So we get cluster zero to cluster seven and each cluster represents one cell type. But right now, as you see here, we don't know the identity of each cell. We just know they have similar expression. So next step is that we want to find in each cluster what genes are highly expressed. 
And based on this chain, this chain may belong to some markers, like you found one cluster highly expressed MS4A1, so you're definitely sure it's B-cell. So that's why I can say here, we, we do a dot plot. This dot plot show you the ex, uh, expression level of each gene. Uh, so I wanna spend a little bit of time on telling you how to read this plot. So you can see in this plot, each row is a cluster and each column is a gene. And there are two levels of information. First is the color of the dot. Second is the size of the dot. So the color of the dot represents the expression level, whether they are, whether they are highly expressed or not highly expressed. And the size of the dot represents the proportion of the cells in this group that has non-zero expression. So if you see a, a dot which is super dark, but the size is super small, that means in this cluster, only a small proportion of the cells have this gene expressed. But if they express, the expression level is pretty high. So I think this is very useful for you to understand the dot plot. It's better than heat map. Dot plot is well, um, well adopted in the field, and usually you will see a lot of it in the different publications. So after we see these uh, gene expression signatures, then we are able to give them uh, identity of different cell types. For example, we can annotate B cell, T cell, uh, dendritic cells. We, this is the whole pipeline. Usually when you get a single cell and a sequence data, you always go through this whole pipeline. And then you have a specific needs just to do some analysis on your own, but this is very necessary. And uh, this is the standard pipeline. I want you to show you know here. So let's go to some advanced topics of how people are working in this field. I and mean, in machine learning, AI methods can help in these methods. So this is one paper uh, from my group. You can see I'm the first author. So the key idea of it is that you can see in the cell type annotation, there are a lot of steps which needs manual, manual efforts. For example, when you have this dot plot, you need to have some biological knowledge to recognize these markers. And then you say, well, this is MS41, so it should be B cell. You still need some domain knowledge. But for people like me have zero domain knowledge, how can we do this annotation, right? So this method solves the problem, we call it class. The key idea of this method is that there are many published available single cell and sequencing data, which have manual annotation data already available. So when we generate our own data, can we develop a model? This model will automatically learn from the trained, well-labeled data set and automatically help me to do the annotation. So for people who do not have any biological knowledge or you study cancer, but you want to look at some data in brain, can you do the automatic annotation? This is how machine learning can help us. So our method use a neural network here. I think you learn from the multi-layer perception, right? <laughs> in uh, today's workshop, if you still remember the IELU function, KR divergence, I think you already know all these terms, how the function looks like. And our method is trying to learn the information from the source data. You can see the source data spots, they're colored. That means they have cell type annotation and then they learn and the label for the targeted data set, it will automatically help you to do all the annotation. But one assumption here is that the source data and the targeted data, they must have similar cell type. For example, if your model learn how to annotate tumor data and then you try to apply this model to brain, it doesn't work, right? So this came to, to come back to my, the question I have is that for ChatGPT, if you ask him, can you do diagnosis? The answer is definitely no, because it's not trained for that. So going back here again, AI, machine learning is not magic. It came from some knowledge of the, from human and it learned from the existing data set and they can only do this type of task. They cannot be that broad. So another type of analysis is that trajectory inference. So there's a paper called only velocity of single cells, but this velocity does not apply for all the data. For example, in some of the tissue, Human, uh, human brain, most of the cells are differentiated and you will not see any trajectory because they are differentiated a long way and the cell cells life is pretty long. But in some tissue like embryo or healing tissue, you will see the trajectory. So here, as we see, we do cell type, uh, cell type annotation. So one assumption we made is that all the cells are discrete. For example, B cell, T cell, tumor epithelial, they can be separated into different cell types. But sometimes the cell, cell, type, cell type labeling is something continuous. For example, we have cells in stage one and then gradually change to stage two. And some cell may in the transition stage, they have stage 1.5. So at this time, if you want to do a cell type labeling, you will get a very confused result. You don't know why, why they're still connected to each other. You cannot separate them. So that's why people study this methods on a velocity. 
you can see here, they have the cell type labeling, and then they're trying to infer the cell differentiation trajectory using these small arrows. So one assumption here is that this trajectory we can, can be tracked based on their gene expression. Not all genes can, can be utilized here. Many housekeeping genes, they express in a stable level, but for some of the genes, they gradually change. They have a gradient at the trajectory level. So based on these genes, machine learning methods is able to help us to do this type of trajectory inference. Okay, that's all for single cell and sequence data. I think it's pretty fun. I'm trying to avoid a lot of formulas. And any questions so far? I assume you understand, right? <laughs> You're not sleepy at all. That's great. Uh, next, I'm going to uh, the spatial transcriptomics. So yesterday I delivered a seminar for spatial transcriptomics. At that time, I only talk about spatial transcriptomics. But today I want you to do a little comparison. What is the difference between single cell and sequence and spatial transcriptomics? What additional information we have? And with this additional informa information, what additional questions can we ask, right? So spatial transcriptomics is coming out of age. It was selected as a method of the year by Nature Methods in 2020. It's super popular. And one question we want to ask is why do we need spatial information if we already have a single cell and sequencing? So first is my answer is the relationship between cells and their relative locations within tissue is critical for understanding the spatial organization of different cell types. It can also help us to understand the influence of neighboring cells on gene expression and how these gene interactions related to disease pathology in the spatial context of the tissue. So this is a very high level summary. Let me give you, give you one example. For you, uh, you want to study how T cells are interacted with tumor cells and you are using single cell RNA sequencing. And you saw that these T cell and tumor cell, T cell has some expression of the gene related to anti-tumor immune response. And the immune cell ha also have some expression trying to respond to it. But in single cell data, you don't know their location. Maybe these cells are very far away from each other in the tissue. They express, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're interacting with each other, right? If you are not in this room, you're not listening to me. Many people are listening, but they're not listening to my talk. So that's why if we have constraint on the spatial, for example, we look at well, in some region, the tumor cells and T cells, they are closer to each other and they have the gene expression. So we are pretty much sure they are interacting at that location. So that's why spatial information is key. It's another dimension of the biological data. It's super important. So for those who you are not familiar with spatial data, let me introduce again about this data structure. I'll start from this heat map. So this heat map, you will have the same heat map for single cell RNA sequencing data. In single cell RNA sequencing, each row is a single cell, each column is a gene. Number here represents their expression level, and you have this heat map expression. But for spatial data, we have more. We have spatial information, so we have, have this additional X and Y, two columns to map each sample. Each sample may contain multiple cells back onto the image, so we know their spatial coherence information. And with this type of data, we can do many interesting task, for example, spatial clustering, we identify different regions. These regions are not the same cell type. They contain different cell type, but they have share similar function. And in single cell data, we identify cell type markers. But in spatial data, we identify spatially variable genes. That gene, this gene is highly expressed in many cell types, but specifically in a specific location. That is something we are interested in. And we can also examine the cell type distribution among all the space. For example, you will find that Maybe most of the microglia are enriched in cortex layer one or layer two. What is the difference, how they change? And then we can better study the interaction by the spatial constraint. So uh, I'll go over some of the tasks in spatial, uh, spatial transatomics data analysis. The very first task, which is analog to the cell typing information as we did in single cell, is spatial domain detection. Spatial domains are identified as regions that are spatially coherent in both gene expression and histology. So it will help us to understand how the gene expression of cells is influenced by its surrounding environment, which is additional dimension compared to single cell, and how the neighborhood regions interact at the gene expression level. And in spatial domain detection, we have gene expression, we have the histology image information, we also have the spatial location information. So we can combine all these three informations together. So as I, I, I introduced yesterday, we had developed a Spartan. If you don't, don't remind, uh, you can read the paper again, kind of combine the gene expression, spatial location, and image information together to identify different spatial domains. 
This is one example. We have a brain, and then we separate them into white matter, gray matter, cortex, different layer structures. And based on these structures, you can do some, for example, you have multiple samples uh, of normal and Alzheimer's disease, and you can study what Alzheimer's disease change only for the cortex layer. So you can do this type of domain detection and then only extract the region to some comparison. This is definitely more, more fun, I would say, compared to single cell RNA sequencing. And yeah, so one question in this, in, in this um, as you see, the additional dimension of the spatial location and the, 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 the histology image is something people are caring about. So there are multiple methods trying to combine all these three modalities together. So I point out this paper, Muse, because it has an important conclusion is that if you want to separate the spatial regions, there are some regions can only be reviewed by gene expression. Some regions can only be reviewed by histology but some regions can only be reviewed when you combine multimodality together. That means if you do, them, do the domain detection using gene expression or image individually, you are not, never going to cover the hidden region, which may play a biological function role here. So that's why I said all of this information are useful. And the second task, as I said, you identify single cell, in single cell, in single data, you get the cell clusters. Then you want to find the cell type markers. So you know the cell type's identity. Spatially, the same. You identify genes enriched in different regions, and then it tells you how about the uh, gene expression, how, how, about the, how about the identity of the region, how about the fun function of each region. So I think today, since you already talked about the single cell data, you, you know the comparison, right? It's, it's the same. It's like you try to adopt the same pipeline from single cell and sequencing data to spatial transatomics, but you have additional information, but with similar goal. And uh, another interesting part is that for spatial single cell and sequencing data, we have gene expression at a single cell resolution, but we do not have uh, spatial location information. Well, in spatial transatomic data, in some of the data, we have spatial location information, but we do not have single cell resolution. So one nature thinking is to integrate them together. So we can, for example, the sequencing based test data lacks single cell resolution and the gene expression measured in each spot is a mixture of different cells and possibly from different cell types. Well, single cell and sequencing profiles gene expression with single cell resolution, but they lose the spatial location information. So very naturally, given the complementary parts of these two modality of data, one can statistically combine them together to infer the spatial location of each single cell in the tissue. This is like a advanced parts. Show you one picture of the model developed from my lab. Uh, it's, we're trying to start from the single cell data and we also have spatial transatomic data and we use a neural network. And then we're trying to put the single cell back onto the histology image. So we can, can kind of infer the cell types location information. If you are interested, I mean, all of these neural networks, you should be able to understand it after the first workshop. And if you're interested, go and read this paper. You will see a lot of uh, terms which you should be familiar with, the different nodes, different activation functions. It's not magic, just as it is to models. And another way people trying to do is that doing spatial transatomic is still very expensive. But we have the histology image here. One question people ask is that, can we predict the gene expression based on the pathologist's image? So as you're showing here, we have breast glands and cancer in situ, and their nuclear size and other parts are very different. And people can kind of, well, well if we have both gene expression and the, and the histology image, we can kind of figure out the association. And then for some sample, we only have H and E. We can predict their gene expression. This is a very interesting part. For example, here we have, we observed this CFD gene. This gene is highly expressed in the breast gland. So if we have the similar cell morphology information from another tissue section, and we saw, well, it's breast gland and it shows similar histology pattern, we predict it's highly expressed of this CFD gene. This is something people are trying to do in this field. And I think that's pretty much all for the first parts. Uh, so here is the summary. For next generation sequencing, I would say the third generation of sequencing, we have DNA sequencing, RNA sequencing, and today's talk focused on RNA sequencing. 
unsynchronous sequencing, the very first step is alignment. And after doing alignment, we have different types of unsynchronous data, bulk, single cell, spatial. And for each part, we have different tasks. That's pretty much all for the half, first half of the talk. For the second half of the talk, I will try to go over some codes and statistical thing behind the codes, how we do the analysis. If you are experts from statistical mathematics, you are free to leave. But if you're bioinformatics or you want to know the detail, you can stay here and we can discuss more. Uh, I'll take time for questions. Thank you so much. So spatial transcriptomics is something actually I've, I've thought about a lot on the protein side is like spatial locations of different residues in, uh, in conjunction with each other. But that leads to analyzing them leads to like sort of an exponential increase in, in compute time in for, uh, when you're training models and stuff. And I was wondering like how, um, you know, how statisticians and how, you know, uh, uh, genomics experts handle sort of the exponential data that comes from spatial information? Yeah, that's a great question. But if you see the single cell unsequencing data, we have the same issue. I have two solutions. First is feature selection. You have 10,000 genes, you select 1,000. And second issue is that you do dimension reduction. Use PCA to decrease the dimension from 1,000 to 50. So these are in the statistical side how people solve this issue. Another society that would build better laptops, better computational resources to better hold the data. Uh, right now, you can see spatial transatomics is, is a very new technique. So people are not generating large size of data compared to single cell. So we don't have the RAM issue usually. So for single cell data, some of the labs, they have the RAM issue and they have different ways, parallel computing, other parts. So this is kind of like how we handle these problems. Uh, new subtypes of what? New subtypes. Uh, new subtypes of uh, like cell types. Yeah. So this is a, this is a, this is a, this is a good, great question. For example, we have a one project trying to transfer the cell typing annotation, right? But if there is a new cell types, how we are going to label that? They will not, not be able to label that. So in, in many statistical methods, they have this type of technique. For example, we get the different cell types, different clusters, and then we compare it with the reference. For some of the novel cell type we call, or unseen cell types we call it, it will be far away from most of the reference cell types. So our data will give it as an unlabeled part, but it is separated as a new one. So there are many, there are some statistical considerations for this type of situation. Presentation and thank you so much. I uh, you mentioned that the can we closer the to the mic? Oh, okay. Uh, you mentioned the clustering and uh, DE analysis. So uh, my question is, um, sometimes it's hard to get enough data, uh, RN seq data, especially for the um, SRT data. So there are, will be many zero uh, expression level in this, in such sparse matrix. So, um, and we usually use the Wilkinson uh, uh, some test to detect the, uh, to detect the DE. So how, uh, is it reasonable for SRT data or do we have better way to get the results? The answer is yes. There are some statistical methods to consider this. This is a situation called zero inflation. There are a large proportion of the data that are zeros. And you will get a detailed answer in the following workshop. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you, Jen. And I have, a, I have a question about the QC step for single cell RNA seq. So uh, usually there are some, like when we use CREP, the pipeline, there are some default cutoff, for example, the number of features and also the, uh, the percentage of mitochondrial DNA. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how flexible are those cutoff? Like for example, if for one data set, we use a 5% cutoff for the mitochondrial DNA percentage, then we move a large number of our cells. 
can raise the cutoff? Yeah, so the cutoff part, I would say uh, sometimes I, I would expect this cutoff to be robust. For example, when you do some filtering based on the mitochondrial gene, if a gene has like a 10% of the genes are mitochondrial gene, we just filter it out. But if you raise this or you change like 10% or 5%, you will find that most of the cells you removed are, are similar because most of the bad quality cells, they have a very large proportion of the mitochondrial gene, like pretty much over 5%. If you use 5% of 10%, ideal case, this will not make a very huge difference. I'm also going to talk about the mitochondrial gene in the following talk, so we may discuss later. Any other questions or not very statistical questions you can ask? Great, I hope you get most of my talk. <laughs> but you may get a little bit lost in the next workshop. Can you ask another question? So for the beast software, you mentioned that for some of the cells, they have a lot of problems with histology. Uh, specific, yeah, uh, one example is that I have analyzed one data from zebrafish melanoma tissue. And the data structure is like we have a melanoma tumor and a muscle cell surrounding it. If you look at the cell morphology, the muscle cells all look the same. But the muscle cells, which is in the tumor interface, has very distinct expression, very similar expression to the tumor cell. So if you do clustering based on the cell morphology, you will only identify muscle and tumor. And if you only do some clustering based on expression, you will have tumor cells, which also contain the tumor of tumor surrounding muscles. These cells, which we should call tumor surrounding muscles, can only be distinguished by utilizing both information together. Uh, shall we take a break or? And here is the barcode of the, and this is the barcode of the tutorials website. If you're after this meeting, if you want to uh, take a closer look at their codes and their Jupyter notebook, you're free to scan it. So I'll jump to the next one. So usually we're reading the reading the PBMC data. Here are the codes you can see in Python. We import all these packages and then we're reading the file. We get a, a data, which is an instance of the artificial neural network data. So one useful information here is the numbers here. You can see the number is number of observations times the number of variations. That means we have 2,700 cells versus 33,000 genes. So this is a common case in single cell and sequencing data. That means the number of genes is even 10 times or a few times larger than the number of cells you have. So this is people called high dimensional data. And there is another name called dimension of the curse of the dimensions. Sometimes models like linear regression, logistic regression, or generalized linear model, survival model, all these models works well in low dimension. They just don't work on high dimensional data analysis because of the additional dimensions. So the next part is that we want to do some pre-processing. The very first step in this, in this figure is to show highly expressed gene. Show these genes that have the highest fraction of the reads in each single cell. That means for each cell, for, for example, for one cell, we observed 100 counts of the RNA. And what proportion of this RNA belong to what genes? So for example, for in this figure, in this box plot, each dot represents a, a cell. And you can see this M-A-L-L-A-T-1 is the gene which dominated the whole risk count. For example, many cells have less, uh, have more than 2% of their counts are belong to these genes. And if you go to the highest value, if you, you see that many, for some of the cells, 15, more than 15% of the reads observed are from this gene. That means this gene is highly expressed. And comparing to other genes, this ACTB1, it only takes about like a less than 1% for many of the cells. So this is related to the sequencing depths. For example, if you want to uh, measure the expression of some genes that are relatively low expressed, you need higher sequencing depths. If your sequencing depth is low, you are going to miss some bottom genes in this, in this box plot. 
And the next part is that we want to do some, the first round of filtering, filtering both on cells and filtering both on genes. So on gene, for cells, if a cell usually is for all the genes, for all the 3,300 genes, if a cell are, most of the expression are zero, and it has less than 200 genes has non-zero expression, we just filter out the cells. So this is for the trunk nine, this line, filter cells, minimal number of genes equal 20, what they did here. And the second type of filtering is filter genes. If a gene is expressed in less than three cells, that means in most of the, the cells, it has zero expression. That means this gene is not informative. We just drop this gene. You can tune with these numbers, but the, I want to deliver this idea that we can do this type of first round of filtering based on the number of genes they expressed and number of cells has no non-zero expression. And second part is that we want to do quality control. So quality control, we need to have some gold standard to, to make sure we have some idea of how bad the quality is for this data set. So mitochondrial genes are important for quality control because mitochondrial genes are pretty much stable and consistent in most of the cells. So that's why we treat it as a, as a spark gene, spark, uh, sparking genes, like the reference for quality control to assess the quality. So mitochondrials are larger than individual transcript molecules and are less likely to escape through the tears in the cell membrane. And the high proportion of, of, pro, of the mitochondrial genes means the poor quality of the cells, and possibly because of the loss of cytoplasma RNA from the, uh, the, the, the preformed cells. That, mean, that means, for, for example, for one cell, if you observe 100 transcripts, and one and a half of them are mitochondrial transcripts, that means this cell's quality is low. So you will filter out this cell from your study. So as you see, we will remove cells with too many mitochondrial genes expressed or too, uh, too many total counts. So this figure shows uh, the number of counts, uh, the num number of counts, and number of mitochondrial counts of cells. In this violin plot, we call it uh, advanced version of the box plot. In this violin plot, each dot here represents a cell, and the number here, the y-axis here, represents the number of genes by count. And this is the total count. You can see, for most of the genes, it has less than a thousand counts. And in total, we have many genes, and in each cell, we contain. Five, more than 5,000 counts. And this violin plot show the percentage of the mitochondrial genes. So you can see in most of the cells, the proportion of the transcript that belongs to mitochondria is below 5%. So if you do a filtering, for example, we filter out cells which has more than 5% of the mitochondrial genes, you will filter out this long tail. These cells are considered as um, low quality cells. But when you do this filtering, be, be cautious because Sometimes we, are, we have the assumption that these genes, this long tail is not cell type specific. That means we have a better quality cells across all the cell types and it's kind of a randomness. But if you observe that one cell type, for example, maybe one minor cell type, most of their mitochondrial genes are more than 50%. And if you do this type of filtering, you will filter out the whole cell type, which will affect your downstream analysis. So when you do the filtering, always check the cell proportion change in your analysis. And uh, this part is the, uh, yeah, the continued part of the quality control. And these are the dot plot here. So each dot plot here, each dot here represents a cell. And XX represents the total number of counts you have for each cell. And the YX here represents the number of uh, genes by, by counts. So you can see, although we have the whole, whole genome, most of the genes captured by each cell is uh, less than like 300. That means it's a, an imbalance in the gene expression capturing. And this figure on the right is the percentage of, of count that belong to mitochondria. And if we do a filtering here using 5%, 5 we will filter out this small, small region of cells from our data analysis, from our, our analysis. And one thing we ha have already mentioned that even after you, you do the ad hoc filtering, you filter based on mitochondrial, we will arrive at this data, uh, this, uh, data matrix. But in this data matrix, we still have a lot of zeros. This is some phenomenon called zero inflation. That means the zero inf inflation means while well, the proportion of zeros in bulk RNA sequence data is usually 10 to 40%. While in the, in the uh, single cell RNA sequence data, maybe around 90% of the numbers in the, the whole matrix are zeros. This is called zero inflation uh, situation. 
So when people want to do the statistical modeling, that's just the plot expression of one gene, e.g. E -G I, I1. And you can see in this gene, many cells, more than 700 and 500, uh, 7,500 cells have zero expression. That means in your data set, only a very small proportion of the, gene, uh, of, of the cells have this gene's expression. This is uh, very natural because in bulk RNA sequencing data, you have a bulk containing different cell types and for each gene, any of them, maybe there is one or two cells that express these genes, so you will, you will have a non-zero value. But over here, since you have single cell resolution, it is highly possible that some genes in this cell, they just didn't express. So you get a lot of zeros. They may only express like, you have 3,000, you have 30,000 genes and it only have like 2,000 genes highly expressed and they're captured by your experiment. So that's why we have this long zero tail. This is called zero inflation. And this is zero inflation, there is a debate or discussion in this field, the statistical field. They are trying to say whether this, diff, this, zero, um, this high condensed um, zero counts, are they due to statistical, difference or their true biological difference. There's a debate on that. But besides that, how we are going to measure or how we're going to modeling this type of data, it's an it's a art. So usually for many of the model, like linear regression, logistic regression, all these statistical models, they have the assumption of normality. That means the distribution of the variable is normal. But for here, definitely we do not follow the normal distribution. So there are four types of distribution are widely used in the modeling this type of data. First is Poisson distribution. Second is negative binomial distribution. And the, third and, uh, the fourth and the third one are zero inflated Poisson distribution and the zero inflated negative binomial distribution. And here you can see the distributions type. In Poisson distribution, and all of these three, four distribution have a high proportion of zeros. And if you do a comparison, so first the comparison between Poisson and non, uh, negative binomial is that negative binomial, Poisson distribution is just a special case of ne negative binomial. Poisson distribution is assume the same variance and mean, while negative binomial di distribution have additional parameters to control. So the dispersion may exceed the main mean of this distribution. And if we do a visual comparison of these four distributions, so with the same mean, zero inflated Poisson and a negative binomial distribution have more zeros than the Poissons and, and the zero inflated negative binomial has the most zeros as you can see here. The proportion of the zero inflated uh, zero inflated negative binomial distribution have a proportion of 60% 60, uh, 60 of them are zeros. So if, you're, if you take a look at your data and more than 60% of your numbers are zeros, you can consider using the zero inflated negative binomial distribution. And uh, between zero inflated Poisson and a negative binomial distribution, which have more zeros depends on their parameter values. When, when, when they have the same zero proportion, their non-zero distribution are still different. So the zero proportion is one thing you should consider, but other than the zero proportion, the rest of the non-zero values, what are their distribution is something you still need to take consideration and do a comparison. So you can choose the right, right distribution to model. So moreover, when the four distribution have the same mean, compared with Poisson and the zero inflated Poisson, negative binomial and zero inflated negative binomial have the heavier right tails. So you can see from the tails. So the greater probability of taking larger values. So maybe for different genes, you should use different distribution for modeling, but uh, usually in our data analysis, for, we just use one distribution to modeling all the genes. And people ask, are there any other ways we can do that? Because I, I'm not good at statistics, I don't know which di distribution I should choose. And the answer is yes. So usually for these highly skewed data, log transformation, plus one log transformation is widely adopted in the field. So for example, as you can show here, uh, this is the original expression of EGI1. And if you do a log transformation, you will get result in the distribution on the right. Its normality is much better. So if you just want to do a modeling without like understanding the distribution or doing putation, you just have a distribution to model the, the genes counts then I would suggest you to do a log transfer and you will get a distribution with better normality. So this kind of solved the problem, like for single cell ion data, people always use log and why they are using log, these two distribution are the answer. And as I said before, we have 10,000 genes and we only select 1,000 of it for dimensional reduction. So how we are going to select this 1,000 genes as art? This step is called identify highly variable genes. So when we do on a scan high data, we just use this column, th these two command lines to select the highly variable genes. But why we do this type of selection? Here, I'm trying to explain here. 
you can see if we order this, we each dot here represent a gene. And the xx is the expression value of this gene. And the yx is the dispersion, that is the variability of this gene. And then we can plot all genes on this figure. So you want to select the genes that first is, you want to select genes have high expression mean. You don't want a gene has a, has a mean value pretty much low. So you want to select some number in the right region of the, of the dot plot. But you also want to select the gene that are informative. That means if a gene is highly expressed, but it has high expression in all cells, it's not informative. So you want to select the gene have high variability. By combining these two criteria on this figure, you will select genes that fall onto the top right region on this figure, high mean and high variance. So when we do highly variable gene selection, we do this plot and then we draw a line, x equals to y. And then we select the genes that are on the upper side of this line. So that's why we select highly variable genes. It depends on the mean, depends on the variance, both. None of them are, uh, can be overlooked. And then we, you can see this, this trunk, 19 is for, we select the name of the highly variable genes and we do a subset of the gene list. So we get a limited number of genes we selected. Another R is like how, how, how much number we should select. We can order these genes and how much number we should use. Usually for highly variable gene selection, we select a large number of it. For example, you have more than 10,000 genes. And then you do highly variable gene selection, you either select 5,000, 2,000, you're not going to select a few hundred because you're going to miss a lot of information. So this gene can kind of, uh, only half of the gene are still left, but it still face the high dimensional issue. And next part is that we want to do principal component analysis, PCA. So PCA is trying, trying to, uh, PCA based from the statistic is on uh, singular value decomposition methods. So it's kind of trying to use a linear uh, combination of existing features to represent the whole data. And finally, for example, you have a thousand features, you will have different number of PCs. And this is the result of the PC. You can see we only plot the data using PC1 and PC2, only use two dimensions and all the data are pretty much separated. And there is a way to select the number of PCs. So this is how we do the PCA. So imagine you have a thousand genes left after the highly variable gene selection. And then we conduct the PCA analysis and the PCA will have the choice, the flexibility to choose how many PCs you want to include in your data. So we order PCs by, their, by the variance it can capture. For example, for all, the, for all the samples in the data with all the thousand genes, there are variance of the data. And the first PCA can explain around 20% of the variance. And the second PCA can explain maybe 15% of the variance. So the key idea is that how many PCs I should include if I want to include 95% of the variance in this data. So usually people do this way to select the number of PCs. If you don't want to do that, you just use the top 40 or, or top 50, that will be enough. So you can say, for example, if I want to cover the 60% of the variance in this data, maybe you see the job here, maybe I should use from PC1 to PC11, then that's enough. But 11 dimension is, is still too small, maybe I want more so I can use 20 PCs. Okay, so after we get the PCs, we will get the, we will perform all the downstream analysis using the PC rather than the uh, original gene expression. For example, you have a um, hundred cells and many genes, but you you only use thirty PCs. Then you will have a hundred by thirty matrix. It's pretty much small, and we can start it to do, do some analysis on. It. And the first thing, as I said, in single cell angle sequence analysis is for cell type classification. And here, in order to understand this part, I separate the cell type classification into three steps. The first step is that we want to compute the neighborhood graph. That means if we project all the cells into the 30 dimensions, we want to find them into different clusters. And the clusters is based on the similarity of these 30 PCs, which means the Euclidean distance from these cells in this high dimensional space. So that's why we want to compute the neighborhood graph. So basically speaking, this, this step is pretty simple. It's just for all the cells, we, can, we calculate their distance based on 30 PCs. And based on their pairwise distance, we can separate them into different clusters. As you can see here, after the neighborhood graph capture from this figure, we can separate the whole uh, spots maybe into three clusters or four clusters or five clusters based on the PCs dimension reduction. 
The second step is clustering. You already have the distance, but you just need a cutoff. For example, we have distance, and I said, we have a threat holding. For any two spots that are far away from this, larger from this distance, we, they belong to different clusters. But for any two spots, they are closer than this distance. They are be counted as the same cluster. By applying this, tech, this uh, idea, we will get the clustering result as shown here. We, we are finally generated eight clusters of different uh, cell types. And we visualize some of the gene expression. You can see this CST3 is highly expressed in these three clusters. That means one gene, they may be highly expressed in more than one cluster, but they kind of follow the, some pattern in the high dimensional PCA spaces. So uh, after we get the cell typing thing, another type of analysis is that how can we visualize the cells? For example, we have 30 PCs, 30 dimensional space. People cannot see the 30 dimensional space. How we are going to project the cells into a two dimensional space and then people were able to see that. So some, some uh, requirement for the two dimensional space is that first you separate all the cells into eight clusters. So the eight clusters should be separated on a two dimensional space, even you only use two dimension. And there are many ways for, for this purpose. The simplest one is that you only use the two PCs, the first one and the second one. The first one may ex expand like 20% of the variance. The second one may expand like 15% of the variance. But imagine that you still has a lot of variance which are neglected by the remaining PCs. So using the first two PC is a doable solution, but it's definitely not perfect. And people are using other two methods more frequently. The first one is called T distribution stochastic neighboring embedding, short for TSNI. And second one is called a uniform mani manifold approximation and projection, which is short for UMAP. So people usually use, uh, I'll try to discuss more about the UMAP here. TSNI is similar, they, they, they both work well. So the UMAP starts from the dimension reduction, the project the high dimen dimensional features to a two dimensional space. And they're competitive with Petisney methods. UMAC can preserve more of the global structure of the superior run and, and a better running time with better performance. And they are widely used in single cell and sequencing data analysis. So for UMAP, the, usually the manifold, uh, the basic idea of UMAP is to use the local manifold approximation and the patches, to get, patches together with their local fuzzy simplicity set representative to construct a topolog topology representation of the high dimensional data. This may be difficult to understand, but you hear, as you can show here, we have an elephant like the shape of the cells, maybe in a you know, three dimensional space. And after projection, we will get this two dimensional space trying to represent its, uh, its uh, similarity measurements. And given some low dimensional representative of the data, a similar process can be used to construct the equivalent, topo equivalent topology representation. And the UMAP then optimize the layer out of the data representing the low dimensional space to minimize the cross entropy between the two topology representations. So it may be difficult to understand, but um, only thing you need to remember about UMAP is that it's trying to minimize the cross entropy between the two topology representations. Then we will get this two dimensional embedding. And UMAP is pretty stable. That means UMAP does not uh, include any stochastic uh, process. But for TSNI, it's uh, have more randomness because it's trying to get sample from a T distribution. So every round, every round of TSNI will give you different results, but the cluster similarity will be very similar. So the next step is that we have visualized all the cell type, visualized all the clusters. The next part is that how can we find which cell, uh, which gene is highly enriched in each cluster, then it will help us to identify the uh, um, cell type markers, then identify the cell types. So here uh, in, in, in SCAMPI, we use the differential expression analysis. So differential expression analysis is very simple. For example, you want to identify the genes that are highly expressed in cluster zero. You just do a two sample t-test by comparing cluster zero versus the rest. And then for example, for here, for the, for the first part in cluster zero, it will give us your order of genes. Higher the order, that means the gene is more highly expressed in cluster zero compared to others. But this uh, two sample t-test, if you know that t-test is based on normality, you get the normal distribution, then the t-distribution approximation. So all these data analysis are performed based on the log transform of the data. There are also some alternative methods trying to do this differential expression analysis based on the four distribution per song. Uh, negative binomial zero inflated of the two versions are detected. And sometimes they show 
better performance compared to this the, the t, t test because you're trying to oversimplify the whole distribution by taking a log. So you will pay in some steps in the downstream analysis. Uh, but for analysis purpose, you can use a t test. So people will ask if you use you if you do not do the log transfer, you will see the problem here. When you do the t test, you will get a very absurd result because your your distribution of the counts or the expression is not normal. So that's why the log transformation should be performed at the very beginning here. Next part is to find the markers. Usually for each cluster, maybe we just pick the top five or top three, we also, or, or we use some criteria. For example, for each cluster, we will have its markers. And based on these markers, we will identify what cell types they are belonging to. And then a perfect labeling of different cell types will be performed. That is the whole step of doing the cell type labeling and finding the markers. So due to the time limits, that's pretty much all I want to share today. I still have five minutes to go questions. Yeah, that's a great question. For example, in this uh, green cluster, which annotated a B cell, maybe half of them are highly expressed for the B cell markers, other half are not. So that means you should do a ne next round of clustering to further separate this cluster into more. And then you have better confidence to do the clustering. So this is related to how you decide the number of clusters in the clustering step. Sometimes, for example, if you in your clustering, if you set a number of clusters to be pretty small, this B cell and a CD4 T cell, they may be clustered as one. When you examine the marker genes, it's difficult to, uh, to check their identity. So that's why you need to try different number of clusters and then to examine them manually to get a better, uh, to, to get the optimized cell type assignment. Okay, so usually for the pre-processing uh, pre step, it's kind of fixed. So if you go back to, for your question, I think it's good for you to go back to the website and look there what they did. After they do the, nom the log transfer, they have a second round of normalization. And this normal, they have like a second round and a third round, you can perform all of them. Usually it's kind of fixed for any data set, you can do this three and they're comparable. I didn't go to that detail because time limitation. <laughs> So the first two components is only used for visualization. When you're trying to do the analysis, you are still using the first 30 or 40%. So that means you still capture most of the information. But for visualization, just to take a generator image, then you can use two of them. So UMAP is not used for analysis. For example, after you get a UMAP, you have two dimensions. You don't use these two dimensions to, to do cell type classification or clustering. You still use the 30%, the 30 PCs.
arm velocity is like a, how cells gene expression gradiently change. So arm velocity does, that not, does not have some meaning. For example, it's a pretty developed tissue. There's no arm velocity anymore. If you even you, you infer the trajectory, it's not meaningful. So arm velocity is, is a cell, it's a tissue specific thing. I would say in embryo on healing tissue, people infer the trajectory, but we don't know how to explain that. We still need to have some expertise to explain how the cell differentiate or, or what, is, what is the meaning of that trajectory. But usually, for example, angular velocity inference will always require you to give us a root of the starting point, for example, stem cell, and then they differentiate. Even for the same data set, if you give different root, it, it will give you different trees. This is based on what biological question you are trying to study. I really enjoyed the talk. So I was wondering when you're doing TSNE or like you map, how do you understand the contribution of features in clustering? So in PCA, we have like loadings through which we understand the contribution of feature in like sample separation. So I'm really intrigued. How do you understand the contribution of features in cluster separation? This is my first question. And in general, how do I engineer features? I mean, how do I select features and engineer them to better separate or better cluster my data? Thank you. Okay, I think the first part is that we do some plotting like that. If you are interested, you want to see how CST3 has contributed to this separation. You just visualize it. And you'll see that this CST3 is dominated the separation of the uh, the orange one, the brown one, the pink one, separating these three from others. So I think it's kind of a visual examination. If you want to do some derivation, like in PCA, you know the beta coefficient of each part, you can definitely try that. But the, the key idea of after dimensional reduction is that we only look at the information we do not trace back because it's difficult. And for your second question, how you select the genes, I think it's related to biological uh, expertise. For example, if you have a well-known G list of the cell types, right? You have one cell type and you pretty much want to separate it. And then you know there are cell type markers. You can, in the feature selection step, as we, as we do highly variable gene selection, you can do your own interested gene list selection and then perform downstream analysis. You will get the result you want. So I'm sorry, I, I, I have a follow-up question on that. So uh, when, uh, so are you saying that when um, reducing dimension, that there's no way to understand the contribution of features? In my mind, I was thinking of whether I could reduce the dimension through engineering some features and using those engineered features to understand their contribution in separation. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think it's doable, but you need to have a better idea of the, what features and what combinations they should, you are interested in. For example, you are interested in a few genes. You just want to look at these genes. And then you can do some specific step to do the separation by highlighting this gene's contribution in your classroom results. It's statistically doable. I think that this step, usually in cell typing step, is not only for our statistical analysis tool. We always do this task with other collaborators together. For example, we have the classroom result, you getting five cell types, 10 cell types, and 15 cell types. And we show our collaborator the cell type markers expression. And then they will help us to do the annotation. And they said, well, I like the result with 10 clusters. It's more stable, making sense to me. Because all the results are making sense. For example, in, if you get five clusters, you are separating the B cell and T cells. But if you get 10 clusters, you will subset CD4 T, CD8 T, T helpers. So it depends on the goal of it. For example, you only want to get a separation of the immunes versus the tumor parts, then you may stop at five. So this is, in this part, I highly recommend you to communicate with your collaborator so they can decide what cluster, number of clusters you're finally going to achieve.
Yeah, not certain expected. This is something we can always trim because cells have cell types, cell states, and different hierarchical structures. You are not going to end up with a perfect separation, perfect number of clusters which works on this data set. Yes, I think we examine each gene at a time. And then we compare this gene's in-group in expression versus out-group expression. So it's a paired a two sample t-test. So is it like an average expression in all of your uh, Yes, we use all, all the others. You can say zero versus the remaining, the rest. But you can do some specific. For example, you want to compare cluster one and cluster zero, you can definitely change. I think that's pretty much all, I, and I have to go, go back there. And if you have any questions, just uh, shoot me an email or message. Did I, did I leave my email here? No, but you can find my email on my lab website. <laughs> All right, so uh, I think that's, that's it. So we're at the end, and uh, thank you all for coming. I hope you found the, the sessions as well as the workshops useful. Uh, so, you know, please uh, think about ways in which you can build upon what you've learned in the past two days. I know it's a lot of information, but we're going to make the recordings available. So the, the talks and the workshops have been recorded. So, so if you really want to, um, uh, you know, find out more or if you've missed some parts of the workshop or the talks, you know, feel free to reach out to Jara or Sandra, and they'll be uh, able to make the recordings available to you, okay? Well, thank you all, and let's uh, give everyone a big round of applause. Uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. I think we're, we're, we're done, so. <laughs>